Chapter Eleven of the Four Feathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Durrance hears news of Feversham. A month later, Durrance arrived in London and discovered a letter from Ethne awaiting him at his club. It told him simply that she was staying with Mrs. Adair and would be glad if he would find the time to call. But there was a black border to the paper and the envelope. Durrance called at Hill Street the next afternoon and found Ethne alone. I did not write to Wadi Halfa, she explained at once, for I thought that you would be on your way home before my letter could arrive. My father died last month, towards the end of May. I was afraid when I got your letter that you would have this to tell me. He replied, I am very sorry you will miss him. More than I can say, said she, with a quiet depth of feeling. He died one morning early, I think. I will tell you if you would care to hear. And she related to him the matter of Dermod's death, of which a chill was the occasion rather than the cause for he died of gradual dissolution rather than a definite disease. It was a curious story which Ethne had to tell, for it seemed that just before his death, Dermod recaptured something of his old masterful spirit. We knew that he was dying, Ethne said. He knew it too, and at seven o'clock of the afternoon after, she hesitated for a moment and resumed. After he had spoken for a little while to me, he called his dog by name. The dog sprang at once onto the bed, though his voice had not risen above a whisper, and crouching quite close, pushed its muzzle with a whine under my father's hand. Then he told me to leave him and the dog altogether alone. I was to shut the door upon him. The dog would tell me when to open it again. I obeyed him and waited outside the door until one o'clock. Then a loud, sudden howl moaned through the house. She stopped for a while. This pause was the only sign of distress which she gave, and in a moment she was on, speaking quite simply, without any of the affections of grief. It was trying to wait outside that door while the afternoon faded and the night came. It was night, of course, long before the end. He would have no lamp left in his room. One imagined him just the other side of that thin door panel, lying very still and silent in the great four-poster bed, with his face towards the hills and the light falling. One imagined the room slipping away into darkness and the window continually looming into a great importance and the dog by his side and no one else. Right to the very end. He would have it that way, but it was rather hard for me. Durant said nothing in reply, but gave her in full measure what she most needed, the sympathy of his silence. He imagined those hours in the passage, six hours of twilight and darkness. He could picture her standing close by the door with her ear, perhaps to the panel, and a hand upon her heart to check its loud beating. There was something rather cruel, he thought, in Demard's resolve to die alone. It was Ethne who broke the silence. I said that my father spoke to me just before he told me to leave him. Of whom do you think he spoke? She was looking directly at Durrance as she put the question. From neither her eyes nor the level tone of her voice could he gather anything of the answer. But a sudden throb of hope caught away his breath. Tell me, he said, in a sort of suspense, as he leaned forward in his chair. Of Mr. Feversham, she answered, and he drew back again and rather suddenly. It was evident that this was not the name which he had expected. He took his eyes from her and stared downward at the carpet so that she might not see his face. My father was always very fond of him, she continued gently. I think that I would like to know if you have any knowledge of what he is doing or where he is. Durrance did not answer, nor did he raise his face. He reflected upon the strange strong hold which Harry Feversham kept upon the affections of those who had once known him well so that even the man whom he had wronged, upon whose daughter he had brought much suffering, must remember him with kindliness upon his deathbed. 
the reflection was not without its bitterness to durrance at this moment and this bitterness he was afraid that his face and voice might both betray but he was compelled to speak for ethne insisted you have never come across him i suppose she asked durrance rose from his seat and walked to the window before he answered he spoke looking out into the street but though he thus concealed the expression of his face a thrill of deep anger sounded through his words in spite of his efforts to subdue his tones no he said i never have and suddenly his anger had its way with him it chose as well as informed his words and i never wished to he cried he was my friend i know but i cannot remember that friendship now i can only think that if he had been the true man we took him for he would not have waited alone in that dark passage during those six hours he turned again to the centre of the room and asked abruptly you are going back to glenalla yes you will live there alone yes for a little while there was silence between them then durrance walked round to the back of her chair you once said that you would perhaps tell me why your engagement was broken off but you know she said what you said at the window showed that you knew no i do not one or two words your father let drop he asked me for news of feversham the last time that i spoke with him but i know nothing definite i should like you to tell me ethne shook her head and leaned forward with her elbows on her knees not now she said and silence again followed her words durrance broke it again i have only one more year at halfa it would be wise to leave egypt then i think i do not expect much will be done in the soudan for some little while i do not think that i will stay there in any case i mean even if you should decide to remain alone at glenalla ethne made no pretence to ignore the suggestion of his words we are neither of us children she said you have all your life to think of we should be prudent yes said durrance with a sudden exasperation but the right kind of prudence the prudence which knows that it's worth while to dare a good deal ethne did not move she was leaning forward with her back towards him so that he could see nothing of her face and for a long while she remained in this attitude quite silent and very still she asked the question at last and in a very low and gentle voice do you want me so very much and before he could answer she turned quickly towards him try not to she exclaimed earnestly for this one year try not to you have much to occupy your thoughts try to forget me altogether and there was just sufficient regret in her tone the regret at the prospect of losing a valued friend take all the sting from her words to confirm durrance in his delusion that but for her fear that she would spoil his career she would answer him in very different words mrs adair came into the room before he could reply and thus he carried away with him his delusion he dined that evening at his club and sat afterwards smoking a cigar under the big tree where he sat so persistently a year before in his vain quest for news of harry feversham it was much the same sort of clear night as that on which he had seen lieutenant such limp into the courtyard and hesitate at the sight of him the strip of sky was cloudless and starry overhead the air had the pleasant languor of a summer night in june the lights flashing from the windows and doorways gave to the leaves of the trees the fresh green look of spring and outside in the roadway the carriages rolled with a thunderous hum like the sound of the sea and on this night too there came a man into the courtyard who knew durrance but he did not hesitate he came straight up to durrance and sat down upon the seat at his side durrance dropped the paper at which he was glancing and held out his hand how do you do said he the friend was captain mather i was wondering whether i should meet you when i read the evening paper i knew that it was about the time one might expect to find you in london you have seen i suppose what asked durrance then you haven't replied mather he picked up the newspaper which durrance had dropped and turned over the sheets 
searching for the piece of news which he required you remember that last reconnaissance we made from suakin very well we halted by the sinkat port at midday there was an arab hiding in the trees at the back of the glacis yes have you forgotten the yarn he told you about gordon's letters and the wall of a house in berber no i had not forgotten then there's something which will interest you said captain mather having folded the paper to his satisfaction handed it to durrance and pointed to a paragraph it was a short paragraph it gave no details it was the merest summary and durrance read it through between the puffs of his cigar the fellow must have gone back to berber after all said he a risky business abu fatma that was the man's name the paragraph made no mention of abu fatma or indeed of any man except captain willoughby the deputy governor of suakin it merely announced that certain letters which the mahdi had sent to gordon summoning him to surrender khartoum and inviting him to be a convert to the modest religion together with copy of gordon's curt replies have been recovered from a wall in berber and brought safely to captain willoughby at suakin they were hardly worth risking a life for said mather perhaps not replied durrance a little doubtfully but after all one is glad they have been recovered perhaps the copies are in gordon's own hand they are at all events of an historic interest in a way no doubt said mather but even so their recovery throws no light upon the history of the siege it can make no real difference to anyone not even to the historian that is true durrance agreed and there was nothing more untrue in the same spot where he had sought for news of feversham news had now come to him only he did not know he was in the dark he could not appreciate that here was news which however little it might trouble the historian touched his life at the springs he dismissed the paragraph from his mind and sat thinking over the conversation which had passed that afternoon between ethne and himself and without discouragement ethne had mentioned harry feversham it was true had asked for news of him but she might have been nay she probably had been moved to ask because her father's last words had referred to him she had spoken his name in a perfectly steady voice he remembered and indeed the mere fact that she had spoken it at all might be taken as a sign that it had no longer any power with her there was something hopeful to his mind in her very request that he should try during this one year to admit her from her thoughts for it seemed almost to imply that if he could not she might at the end of it perhaps give to him the answer for which he longed he allowed a few days to pass then called again at mrs adair's house but he found only mrs adair ethne had left london and returned to donegal she had left rather suddenly mrs adair told him and mrs adair had no sure knowledge of the reason of her going durrance however had no doubt as to the reason ethne was putting into practice the policy which she had commended to his thoughts he was to try to forget her and she would help him to success so far as she could by her absence from his sight and in attributing this reason to her durrance was right but one thing ethne had forgotten she had not asked him to cease to write to her and accordingly in the autumn of that year the letters began again to come from the sudan she was frankly glad to receive them but at the same time she was troubled for in spite of their careful reticence every now and then a phrase leaped out it might be merely the repetition of some trivial sentence which she had spoken long ago and long ago forgotten and she could not but see that in spite of her prayer she lived perpetually in his thoughts there was a strain of hopefulness too as though he moved in a world painted with new colours and suddenly grown musical ethne had never freed herself from the haunting fear that one man's life had been spoilt because of her she had never faltered from her determination that this should not happen with a second 
Only with Durrance's letter before her, she could not evade a new and perplexing question. By what means was that possibility to be avoided? There were two ways. By choosing which of them could she fulfill her determination? She was no longer so sure as she had been the year before that his career was all in all. The question recurred to her again and again. She took it out with her on the hillside with the letters and pondered and puzzled over it and got never an inch nearer to a solution. Even a violin failed her in this strait. End of chapter 11「it was a night of May, and outside the mess room at Wadi Halfa, three officers were smoking on a grass knoll above the Nile. The moon was at its full, and the strong light had robbed even the planets of their lusters. The smaller stars were not visible at all, and the sky washed of its dark color curved overhead, pearly-hued and luminous. The three officers sat in their lounge chairs and smoked silently, while the bullfrogs croaked from an island in mid-river. At the bottom of the small, steep cliff on which they sat, the Nile, so sluggish was its flow, shone like a burnished mirror, and from the opposite bank the desert stretched away to infinite distances, a vast plain with scattered hummocks, a plain white as a hoar frost on the surface of which the stones sparkled like jewels. Behind the three officers of the garrison, the roof of the mess-room veranda threw a shadow on the ground. It seemed a solid piece of blackness. One of the three officers struck a match and held it to the end of his cigar. The flame lit up a troubled and anxious face. "'I hope that no harm has come to him,' he said, as he threw the match away. "'I wish that I could say I believed it. The speaker was a man of middle age, and the colonel of a Sudanese battalion. He was answered by a man whose hair had gone gray, it is true, but gray hair is frequent in the Sudan, and his unlined face still showed that he was young.' He was Lieutenant Calder of the Engineers. Youth, however, in this instance, had no optimism wherewith to challenge Colonel Dawson. He left Halfa eight weeks ago, eh? he said gloomily. Eight weeks today, replied the Colonel. It was the third officer, a tall, spare, long-necked major of the Army Service Corps, who alone hazarded a cheerful prophecy. It's early days to conclude Durrance has got scuppered, said he. One knows Durrance. Give him a campfire in the desert and a couple of sheiks to sit round it with him, and he'll buck to them for a month and never feel bored at the end. While here there are letters, and there's an office, and there's a desk in the office, and everything he loathes and can't do with. You'll see Durrance will turn up right enough, though he won't hurry about it. He is three weeks overdue, objected the colonel, and he's methodical after a fashion, I'm afraid. Major Walters pointed out his arm to the white, empty desert across the river. If he had traveled that way, westward, I might agree, he said. But Durrance went east through the mountain country toward Berenice and the Red Sea. The tribes he went to visit were quiet, even in the worst times, when Osman Digna lay before Sopkin. The colonel, however, took no comfort from Walters' confidence. He tugged at his mustache and repeated, He is three weeks overdue. Lieutenant Calder knocked the ashes from his pipe and refilled it. He leaned forward in his chair as he pressed the tobacco down with his thumb, and he said slowly, I wonder. It is just possible that some sort of trap was laid for Durrance. I am not sure. I never mentioned before what I knew, because until lately I did not suspect that it could have anything to do with his delay. But now I begin to wonder. You remember the night before he started. Yes, said Dawson, and he hitched his chair a little nearer. Calder was the one man in Wadi Halfa who could claim something like intimacy with Durrance. 
Despite their difference in rank, there was no great disparity in the age between the two men. And from the first, when Calder had come inexperienced and fresh from England, but with a great ardor to acquire comprehensive experience, Durrance, in his recitant way, had been at pains to show the newcomer considerable friendship. Calder, therefore, might be likely to know. I too remember that night, said Walters. Durrance dined at the mess and went away early to prepare for his journey. His preparations were made already, said Calder. He went away early, as you say, but he did not go to his quarters. He walked along the river bank to Tufakay. Wadi Halfa was the military station. Tufakay, a little frontier town to the north, separated from Halfa by a mile of river bank. A few Greeks kept stores there. A few bare and dirty cafes faced the street between native cook shops and tobacconists. A noisy little town where the negro from the Dinka country jolted the fella from the Delta, and the air was torn with many dialects. A thronged little town, which yet lacked to European ears one distinctive element of a throng. There was no ring of footsteps. The crowd walked on sand, and for the most part with naked feet so that if for a rare moment the sharp high cries and the perpetual voices ceased, the figures of men and women flitted by noiseless as ghosts. And even at night, when the streets were most crowded and the uproar loudest, it seemed that underneath the noise, and almost appreciable to the ear, there lay a deep and brooding silence, the silence of deserts and the east. Durrance went down to Tufakay at ten o'clock that night, said Calder, I went to his quarters at eleven. He had not returned. He was starting eastward at four in the morning, and there was some detail of business on which I wished to speak to him before he went. So I waited for his return. He came in about a quarter of an hour afterwards and told me at once I must be quick, since he was expecting a visitor. He spoke quickly and rather restlessly. He seemed to be laboring under some excitement. He barely listened to what I had to say, and he answered me at random. It was quite evident that he was moved, and rather deeply moved, by some unusual feeling, though at the nature of the feeling I could not guess, for at one moment it seemed certainly to be anger, and the next moment he relaxed into a laugh, as though in spite of himself he was glad. However, he bundled me out, and as I went I heard him telling his servant to go to bed, because, though he expected a visitor, he would admit the visitor himself. Well, said Dawson. And who was the visitor? I do not know, answered Calder. The one thing I do know is that when Durrance's servant went to call him at four o'clock for his journey, he found Durrance still sitting on the veranda outside his quarters, as though he still expected his visitor. The visitor had not come. And Durrance left no message? No. I was up myself before he started. I thought that he was puzzled and worried. I thought, too, that he meant to tell me what was the matter. I still think that he had that in his mind, but that he could not decide. For even as he had taken his seat upon his saddle and his camel had risen from the ground, he turned and looked down towards me. But he thought better of it, or worse, as the case may be. At all events, he did not speak. He struck the camel on the flank with his stick and rode slowly past the post office and out into the desert, with his head sunk upon his breast. I wonder whether he rode into a trap. Who could this visitor have been whom he meets in the street of Tufakay? And who must come so secretly to Wadi Halfa? What could have been his business with Durrance? Important business, troublesome business. So much is evident. And he did not come to transact it. Was the whole thing a lure to which we have not the clue? Like Colonel Dawson, I am afraid. There was a silence after he had finished, which Major Walters was the first to break. He offered no argument. He simply expressed his unalterable cheerfulness. I don't think Durrance has got scuppered, said he, as he rose from his chair. I know what I shall do, said the colonel. I shall send out a strong search party in the morning. And the next morning, as they sat at breakfast on the veranda, he at once proceeded to describe the force which he meant to dispatch. Major Waters, too, it seemed, in spite of his hopeful prophecies, had pondered during the night over Calder's story, and he leaned across the table to Calder. Did you ever inquire whom Durrance talked with at Tufakay on that night? he asked. 
I did, and there's a point that puzzles me, said Calder. He was sitting with his back to the Nile and his face toward the glass doors of the mess room, and he spoke to Walters, who was directly opposite. I could not find that he talked to more than one person, and that one person could not by any likelihood have been the visitor he expected. Durant stopped in front of a cafe where some strolling musicians, who had somehow wandered up the Tufake, were playing and singing for their night's lodging. One of them, a Greek, I was told, came outside into the street and took his hat round. Durrance threw a sovereign into the hat. The man turned to thank him, and they talked for a little time together. And as he came to this point, he raised his head. A look of recognition came into his face. He laid his hands upon the table ledge and leaned forward with his feet drawn back beneath his chair as though he was on the point of springing up. But he did not spring up. His look of recognition became one of bewilderment. He glanced round the table and saw that Colonel Dawson was helping himself to cocoa, while Major Walter's eyes were on his plate. There were other officers of the garrison present, but not one had remarked his movement and its sudden arrest. Calder leaned back, and staring curiously in front of him and over the Major's shoulder, continued his story. But I can never hear that Durrance spoke to anyone else. He seemed, except that one knows to the contrary, merely to have strolled through the village and back again to Wadi Halfa. "'That doesn't help us much,' said the Major. "'And it's all you know?' asked the Colonel. "'No, not quite all,' returned Calder, slowly. "'I know, for instance, that the man we are talking about is staring me straight in the face.' At once, everyone at the table turned toward the mess room. "'Durance!' cried the Colonel, springing up. "'When did you get back?' said the Major. Durrance, with the dust of his journey still powdered upon his clothes and a face burnt to the color of red brick, was standing in the doorway and listening with a remarkable intentness to the voices of his fellow officers. It was perhaps noticeable that Calder, who was Durrance's friend, neither rose from his chair nor offered any greeting. He still sat watching Durrance. He still remained curious and perplexed. But as Durrance descended the three steps into the veranda, there came a quick and troubled look of comprehension into his face. "'We expected you three weeks ago,' said Dawson, as he pulled a chair away from an empty place at the table. "'The delay could not be helped,' replied Durrance. He took the chair and drew it up. "'Does my story account for it?' asked Calder. "'Not a bit. It was the Greek musician I expected that night,' he explained with a laugh. "'I was curious to know what stroke of ill luck had cast him out to play the zither for a night's lodging in a cafe at Tufake. That was all. And he added slowly, in a softer voice, Yes, that was all. Meanwhile, you are forgetting your breakfast, said Dawson, as he rose. What will you have? Calder leaned ever so slightly forward with his eyes, quietly resting on Durrance. Durrance looked round the table, then called the mess waiter. Mosa, get me something cold, said he, and the waiter went back into the mess room. Calder nodded his head with a faint smile as though he understood that here was a difficulty rather cleverly surmounted. "'There's tea, coca, and coffee,' he said. "'Help yourself, Durrance.' "'Thanks,' said Durrance. "'I see. But I will get Mosa to bring me a brandy and soda, I think.' And again Calder nodded his head. Durrance ate his breakfast and drank his brandy and soda and talked the while of his journey. He had traveled further eastward than he had intended. He had found the Abaday Arabs quiet amongst their mountains. If they were not disposed to acknowledge allegiance to Egypt, on the other hand, they paid no tribute to Mohammed Achmet. The weather had been good, ibex and antelope plentiful. Durance, on the whole, had reason to be content with his journey, and Calder sat and watched him, and disbelieved every word that he said. The other officers went about their duties. Calder remained behind, and waited until Durance should finish but it seemed that Durrance never would finish. He loitered over his breakfast, and when that was done he pushed his plate away and sat talking. There was no end to his questions as to what had passed at Wadi Halfa during the last eight weeks, no limit to his enthusiasm over the journey from which he had just returned. Finally, however, he stopped with a remarkable abruptness and said with some suspicion to his companion, "'You are taking life easily this morning.' I have not had eight weeks of rears of letters to clear off as you have, Colonel. Calder returned with a laugh, and he saw Durrance's face cloud and his forehead contract. True, he said after a pause. I had forgotten my letters. 
and he rose from his seat at the table, mounted the steps, and passed into the mess room. Coulter immediately sprang up, and with his eyes followed Durance's movements. Durance went to a nail which was fixed in the wall close to the glass doors and on a level with his head. From that nail he took down the key of his office, crossed the room, and went out through the farther door. That door he left open, and Calder could see him walk down the path between the bushes through the tiny garden in front of the mess, unlatch the gate, and cross the open space of sand toward his office. As soon as Durance had disappeared, Calder sat down again, and resting his elbows on the table, propped his face between his hands. Calder was troubled. He was a friend of Durance. He was the one man in Wadi Halfa who possessed something of Durance's confidence. He knew that there were certain letters in a woman's handwriting waiting for him in his office. He was very deeply troubled. Durance had aged during these eight weeks. There were furrows about his mouth where only faint lines had been visible when he started out from Halfa, and it was not merely desert dust which had discolored his hair. His hilarity, too, had an artificial air. He had sat at the table constraining himself to the semblance of high spirits. Calder lit his pipe and sat for a long while by the empty table. Then he took his helmet and crossed the sand to Durance's office. He lifted the latch noiselessly. As noiselessly he opened the door and he looked in. Durance was sitting at his desk with his head bowed upon his arms and all his letters unopened at his side. Calder stepped into the room and closed the door loudly behind him. At once, Durance turned his face to the door. Well, said he, I have a paper, Colonel, which requires your signature, said Calder. It's the authority for the alterations in C. Barracks, you remember? Very well. I will look through it and return it to you signed at lunchtime. Will you give it to me, please? He held out his hand toward Calder. Calder took his pipe from his mouth and, standing thus in full view of Durance, slowly and deliberately placed it into Durance's outstretched palm. It was not until the hot bowl burnt his hand that Durance snatched his arm away. The pipe fell and broke upon the floor. Neither of the two men spoke for a few moments, and then Calder put his arm around Durance's shoulder and asked in a voice gentle as a woman's, How did it happen? Durance buried his face in his hands. The great control which he had exercised till now he was no longer able to sustain. He did not answer, nor did he utter any sound. But he sat shivering from head to foot. How did it happen? Calder asked again, and in a whisper. Durance put another question. How did you find out? You stood in the mess room doorway listening to discover whose voice spoke from where. When I raised my head and saw you, though your eyes rested on my face, there was no recognition in them. I suspected then. When you came down the steps into the veranda, I became almost certain. When you would not help yourself to food, when you reached out your arm over your shoulder so that Musa had to put the brandy and soda safely into your palm, I was sure. I was a fool to try and hide it, said Durance. Of course, I knew all the time that I couldn't for more than a few hours. But even those few hours somehow seemed to gain. How did it happen? There was a high wind, Durance explained. I took my helmet off. It was eight o'clock in the morning. I did not mean to move my camp that day and I was standing outside my tent in my shirt sleeves. So you see that I had not even the collar of a coat to protect the nape of my neck. I was fool enough to run after my helmet, and you must have seen the same thing happen a hundred times. Each time that I stooped to pick it up, it skipped away. Each time that I ran after it, it stopped and waited for me to catch it up. And before one was aware what one was doing, one had run a quarter of a mile. I went down, I was told, like a log just when I had the helmet in my hand. How long ago it happened I don't quite know, for I was ill for a time, and afterwards it was difficult to keep count, since one couldn't tell the difference between day and night. Durance, in a word, had gone blind. He told the rest of his story. He had bidden his followers carry him back to Berber, and then, influenced by the natural wish to hide his calamity as long as he could, he had enjoined upon them silence. Calder heard the story through to the end, and then rose at once to his feet. There's a doctor. He is clever and for a Syrian knows a good deal. I will fetch him here privately and we will hear what he says. Your blindness may be merely temporary. The Syrian doctor, however, pursed up his lips and shook his head. 
he advised an immediate departure to Cairo. It was a case for a specialist. He himself would hesitate to pronounce an opinion, though, to be sure, there was always hope of a cure. Have you ever suffered an injury in the head? he asked. Were you ever thrown from your horse? Were you wounded? No, said Durrance. The Syrian did not disguise his conviction that the case was grave, and after he had departed, both men were silent for some time. Calder had a feeling that any attempt in consolation would be futile in itself, and might, moreover, in betraying his own fear that the hurt was irreparable, only discourage his companion. He turned to the pile of letters and looked them through. There are two letters here, Durrance, he said gently, which you might perhaps care to hear. They are written in a woman's hand, and there is an Irish postmark. Shall I open them? No, exclaimed Durrance suddenly, and his hand dropped quickly upon Calder's arm. By no means. Calder, however, did not put down the letters. He was anxious for private reasons of his own to learn something more of Ethne Eustace than the outside of her letters could reveal. A few rare references made in unusual moments of confidence by Durrance had only informed Calder of her name and assured him that his friend would be very glad to change it if he could. He looked at Durrance, a man so trained to vigor and activity that his very sunburn seemed an essential quality rather than an accident of the country in which he lived. A man, too, who came to the wild, uncitied places of the world with the joy of one who comes into an inheritance. A man to whom those desolate tracks were home, and the fireside and the hedged fields and made roads merely the other places, and he understood the magnitude of the calamity which had befallen him. Therefore he was most anxious to know more of this girl who wrote to Durrance from Donegal, and to gather from her letters, as from a mirror in which her image was reflected, some speculation as to her character, for if she failed, what had this friend of his any longer left? You would like to hear them, I expect, he insisted. You have been away eight weeks, and he was interrupted by a harsh laugh. Do you know what I was thinking when I stopped you, said Durrance? Why, that I would read the letters after you had gone. It takes time to get used to being blind after your eyes have served you pretty well all of your life, and his voice shook ever so little. You will have to help me to answer them, Calder, so read them. Please read them. Calder tore open the envelopes and read the letters through and was satisfied. They gave a record of the simple doings of her mountain village in Donegal and in the simplest terms. But the girl's nature shone out in her telling. Her love of the countryside and of the people who dwelt there was manifest. She could see the humor and the tragedy of the small village troubles. There was a warm friendliness for Durrance, moreover, expressed not so much in a sentence as in the whole spirit of the letters. It was evident that she was most keenly interested in all that he did, that in a way she looked upon his career as a thing in which she had a share, even if it was only a friend's share. And when Calder had ended, he looked again at Durrance, but now with a face of relief. It seemed, too, that Durrance was relieved. After all, one has something to be thankful for, he cried. Think, suppose that I had been engaged to her. She would never have allowed me to break it off once I had gone blind. What an escape! An escape, exclaimed Calder. You don't understand, but I knew a man who went blind. A good fellow, too, before, mind that, before. But a year after, you couldn't have recognized him. He had narrowed down into the most selfish, exacting, egotistical creature it is possible to imagine. I don't wonder. I hardly see how he could help it. I don't blame him, but it wouldn't make life easier for a wife, would it? A helpless husband who can't cross a road without his wife at his elbow is bad enough, but make him a selfish beast in the bargain, full of questions, jealous of her power to go where she will, curious as to every person with whom she speaks. And what then? My God, I am glad that girl refused me. For that I am most grateful. She refused you? asked Calder, and the relief passed from his face and voice. Twice, said Durrance. What an escape! You see, Calder, I shall be more trouble even than the man I told you of. I am not clever. I can't sit in a chair and amuse myself by thinking, not having any intellect to buck about. I have lived out of doors and hard, and that's the only sort of life that suits me. 
I tell you, Calder, you won't be very anxious for much of my society in a year's time. And he laughed again, and with the same harshness. Oh, stop that, said Calder. I will read the rest of your letters to you. He read them, however, without much attention to their contents. His mind was occupied with the two letters from Ethne Eustace, and he was wondering whether there was any deeper emotion than mere friendship hidden beneath the words. Girls refused men for all sorts of queer reasons which had no sense in them, and very often they were sick and sorry about it afterwards, and very often they meant to accept the men all the time. I must answer the letters from Ireland, said Durrance, when he had finished. The rest can wait. Calder held a sheet of paper upon the desk and told Durrance when he was writing on a slant and when he was writing on the blotting pad, and in this way Durrance wrote to tell Ethne that a sunstroke had deprived him of his sight. Calder took that letter away, but he took it to the hospital and asked for the Syrian doctor. The doctor came out to him, and they walked together under the trees in front of the building. Tell me the truth said Calder. The doctor blinked behind his spectacles. The optic nerve is, I think, destroyed, he replied. Then there is no hope? None, if my diagnosis is correct. Calder turned the letter over and over, as though he could not make up his mind what in the world to do with it. Can a sunstroke destroy the optic nerve? he asked at length. A mere sunstroke? No, replied the doctor. But it may be the occasion for the cause one must look deeper calder came to a stop and there was a look of horror in his eyes you mean one must look to the brain yes they walked on for a few paces a further question was in calder's mind but he had some difficulty in speaking it and when he had spoken he waited for the answer in suspense then this calamity is not all there will be more to follow death or but that other alternative he could not bring himself to utter here, however, the doctor was able to reassure him. No, that does not follow. Calder went back to the mess room and called for a brandy and soda. He was more disturbed by the blow which had fallen upon Durrance than he would have cared to own, and he put the letter upon the table and thought of the message of renunciation which it contained, and he could hardly restrain his fingers from tearing it across. It must be sent, he knew, as its destruction would be of no more than a temporary avail yet he could hardly bring himself to post it. With the passage of every minute, he realized more clearly what blindness meant to Durrance. A man not very clever, as he himself was ever the first to acknowledge, and always the inheritor of the other places. How much more it meant to him than to the ordinary run of men. Would the girl, he wondered, understand as clearly? It was very silent that morning on the veranda at Wadi Halfa. The sunlight blazed upon desert and river, not a breath of wind stirred the foliage of any bush. Calder drank his brandy and soda, and slowly that question forced itself more and more into the front of his mind. Would the woman over in Ireland understand? He rose from his chair as he heard Colonel Dawson's voice in the mess room, and taking up his letter walked away to the post office. Durrance's letter was dispatched, but somewhere in the Mediterranean it crossed a letter from Ethne, which Durrance received a fortnight later at Cairo. It was read out to him by Calder, who had obtained leave to come down from Wadi Halfa with his friend. Ethne wrote that she had, during the last months, considered all that he had said when at Glenella and in London. She had read, too, his letters, and understood that in his thoughts of her there had been no change, and that there would be none. She therefore went back upon her old argument that she would, by marriage, be doing him an injury, and she would marry him upon his return to England. That's rough luck, isn't it, said Durrance, when Calder had read the letter through. For here's the one thing I have always wished for, and it comes when I can no longer take it. I think you will find it very difficult to refuse to take it, said Calder. I do not know, Miss Eustace, but I can hazard a guess from the letters of hers which I have read to you. I do not think that she is a woman who will say yes one day, and then because bad times come to you, say no the next or allow you to say no for her either. I have a sort of notion that since she cares for you, and you for her, you are doing little less than insulting her if you imagine that she cannot marry you and still be happy. Durrance thought over that aspect of the question and began to wonder. Calder might be right. Marriage with a blind man, 
it might perhaps be possible if upon both sides there was love. And the letter from Ethne proved, did it not, that on both sides there was love. Besides, there was some trivial compensations which might help to make her sacrifice less burdensome. She could still live in her own country and move in her own home, for the linen house could be rebuilt and the estates cleared of their debt. Besides, said Calder, there is always a possibility of a cure. There is no such possibility, said Durrance, with a decision which quite startled his companion. You know that as well as I do. And he added with a laugh, you needn't start so guiltily. I haven't overheard a word of any of your conversations about me. Then what in the world makes you think that there's no chance? The voice of every doctor who has encouraged me to hope. Their words, yes, their words, tell me to visit specialists in Europe and not lose heart. But their voices give the lie to their words. If one cannot see, one can at all events hear. Calder looked thoughtfully at his friend. This was not the only occasion on which of late Durrance had surprised his friends by an unusual acuteness. Calder glanced uncomfortably at the letter which he was still holding in his hand. When was that letter written, said Durrance suddenly, and immediately upon the question he asked another, what makes you jump? Calder laughed and explained hastily, why I was looking at the letter the moment when you asked, and your question came so pat that I could hardly believe you did not see what I was doing. It was written on the 15th of May. Ah, said Durrance, the day I returned to Wadi Halfa blind. Calder sat in his chair without a movement. He gazed anxiously at his companion. It seemed almost as though he were afraid. His attitude was one of suspense. That's a queer coincidence, said Durrance with a careless laugh. And Calder had an intuition that he was listening with the utmost intentness for some movement on his own part perhaps a relaxation of his attitude, perhaps a breath of relief. Calder did not move, however, and he drew no breath of relief. End of chapter 12 Recording by David Wolf. Chapter 13 of The Four Feathers this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wolf. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter 13. Durrance Begins to See. Ethne stood at the drawing room window of the house in Hill Street. Mrs. Adair sat in front of her tea table. Both women were waiting, and they were both listening for some particular sound to rise up from the street and penetrate into the room. The window stood open that they might hear it the more quickly. It was half past five in the afternoon. June had come round with the exhilaration of its sunlight, and London had sparkled into a city of pleasure and green trees. In the houses opposite, the windows were gay with flowers and in the street below the carriages rolled easily towards the park. A jingle of bells rose upward suddenly and grew loud. Mrs. Adair raised her head quickly. That's a cab, she said. Yes. Ethne leaned forward and looked down. But it's not stopping here. And the jingle grew fainter and died away. Mrs. Adair looked at the clock. Colonel Durrance is late, she said, and she turned curiously towards Ethne. It seemed to her that Ethne had spoken her yes with much more of suspense than eagerness. Her attitude as she leaned forward at the window had been almost one of apprehension, and though Mrs. Adair was not quite sure, she fancied that she detected relief when the cab passed by the house and did not stop. "'I wonder why you didn't go to the station and meet Colonel Durrance,' she asked slowly. The answer came promptly enough. He might have thought that I had come because I looked upon him as rather helpless, and I didn't wish him to think that. He has a servant with him. Ethne looked again out of the window, and once or twice she made a movement as if she was about to speak, and then thought silence the better part. Finally, however, she made up her mind. You remember the telegram I showed to you? From Lieutenant Calder, saying that Colonel Durrance had gone blind? Yes. I want you to promise never to mention it. 
I don't want him to know that I ever received it. Mrs. Adair was puzzled, and she hated to be puzzled. She had been shown the telegram, but she had not been told that Ethne had written to Durrance, pledging herself to him immediately upon its receipt. Ethne, when she showed the telegram, had merely said, I am engaged to him. Mrs. Adair at once believed that the engagement had been of some standing, and she had been allowed to continue in that belief. Will you promise? Ethne insisted. Certainly, my dear, if you like, returned Mrs. Adair, with an ungracious shrug of the shoulders. But there is a reason, I suppose. I don't understand why you exact the promise. Two lives must not be spoilt because of me. There was some ground for Mrs. Adair's suspicion that Ethne expected the blind man to whom she was betrothed with apprehension. It is true that she was a little afraid. Just twelve months had passed since, in this very room, on such a sunlit afternoon. Ethne had bidden Durrance not to forget her, and each letter which she had received had shown that, whether he tried or not, he had not forgotten. Even that last one received three weeks ago, the note scrawled in the handwriting of a child from Wadi Halfa, with the large unsteady words straggling unevenly across the page, and the letters running into one another wherein he had told his calamity and renounced his suit, even that proved, and perhaps more surely than its hopeful forerunners, that he had not forgotten. As she waited at the window, she understood very clearly that it was she herself who must buckle to the hard work of forgetting, or if that was impossible, she must be careful always that by no word let slip, in a forgetful moment she betrayed that she had not forgotten. No, she said, two lives shall not be spoilt because of me. And she turned toward Mrs. Adair. Are you quite sure, Ethne, said Mrs. Adair, that the two lives will not be more surely spoilt by this way of yours, the way of marriage? Don't you think that you will come to feel Colonel Durrance, in spite of your will, something of a hindrance and a drag? Isn't it possible that he may come to feel that too? I wonder. I very much wonder. No, said Ethne, decisively. I shall not feel it, and he must not. The two lives, according to Mrs. Adair, were not the lives of Durrance and Harry Faversham, but of Durrance and Ethne herself. There she was wrong, but Ethne did not dispute the point. She was indeed rather glad that her friend was wrong, and she allowed her to continue in her wrong belief. Ethne resumed her watch at the window, foreseeing her life, planning it out so that never might she be caught off her guard. The task would be difficult, no doubt, and it was no wonder that in these minutes while she waited fear grew upon her lest she should fail. But the end was well worth the effort, and she set her eyes upon that. Durrance had lost everything which made life to him worth living the moment he went blind. Everything except one thing. What should I do if I were crippled? He had said to Harry Faversham on the morning when, for the last time, they had ridden together in the row. A clever man might put up with it. But what should I do if I had to sit in a chair all my days? Ethne had not heard the words, but she understood the man well enough without them. He was by birth the inheritor of other places, and he had lost his heritage. The things which delighted him, the long journeys, the faces of strange countries, the campfire, a mere spark of red light amidst black and empty silence, the hours of sleep in the open under bright stars, the cool night wind of the desert, and the work of government, all these things he had lost. Only one thing remained to him, herself, and only, as she knew very well, herself so long as he could believe she wanted him, and while she was still occupied with her resolve, the cab for which she waited stopped unnoticed at the door. It wasn't until Durrance's servant had actually rung the bell that her attention was again attracted to the street. "'He has come,' she said with a start. Durrance, it was true, was not particularly acute. He had never been inquisitive. He took his friends as he found them. He put them under no microscope. It would have been easy at any time, Ethne reflected, to quiet his suspicions, should he have ever come to entertain any. But now it would be easier than ever. 
there was no reason for apprehension thus she argued but in spite of the argument she rather nerved herself to an encounter than went forward to welcome her betrothed mrs adair slipped out of the room so that ethne was alone when durrance entered at the door she did not move immediately she retained her attitude and position expecting that the change in him would for the first moment shock her but she was surprised for the particular changes which she had expected were noticeable only through their absence his face was worn no doubt his hair had gone gray but there was no air of helplessness or uncertainty and it was that which for his own sake she most dreaded he walked forward into the room as though his eyes saw his memory seemed to tell him exactly where each piece of the furniture stood the most that he did was once or twice to put out a hand where he expected a chair ethne drew silently back into the window rather at a loss with what words to greet him and immediately he smiled and came straight towards her ethne he said it isn't true then she exclaimed you have recovered the words were forced from her by the readiness of his movement it is quite true and i have not recovered he answered but you moved at the window and so i knew that you were there how did you know i made no noise no but the windows open the noise in the street became suddenly louder so i knew that someone in front of the window had moved aside i guessed that it was you their words were thus not perhaps the most customary greeting between a couple meeting on the first occasion after they had become engaged, but they served to hinder embarrassment. Ethne shrank from any perfunctory expression of regret, knowing that there was no need for it, and Durrance had no wish to hear it, for there were many things through which these two understood each other well enough to take as said. They did no more than shake hands when they had spoken and ethne moved back into the room i will give you some tea she said then we can talk yes we must have a talk mustn't we durrance answered seriously he threw off his serious air however and chatted with good humor about the details of his journey home he even found a subject of amusement in his sense of helplessness during the first days of his blindness and ethne's apprehensions rapidly diminished they had indeed almost vanished from her mind when something in his attitude suddenly brought them back. I wrote to you from Wadi Halfa, he said. I don't know whether you could read the letter. Quite well, said Ethne. I got a friend of mine to hold the paper and tell me when I was writing on it or merely on the blotting pad, he continued with a laugh. Calder of the Sappers. But you don't know him. He shot the name out rather quickly, and it came upon Ethne with a shock that he had set a trap to catch her. The curious stillness of his face seemed to tell her that he was listening with an extreme intentness for some start, perhaps even a checked exclamation, which would betray that she knew something of Calder of the Soppers. Did he suspect? she asked herself. Did he know of the telegram? Did he guess that her letter was sent out of pity? She looked into Durrance's face, and it told her nothing except that it was very alert. In the old days, a year ago, the expression of his eyes would have answered her quite certainly, however close he held his tongue. I could read the letter without difficulty, she answered gently. It was the letter you would have written, but I had written to you before, and of course your bad news could make no difference. I take back no word of what I wrote." Durrance sat with his hands upon his knees, leaning forward a little. Again Ethne was at a loss. She could not tell from his manner or his face whether he accepted or questioned her answer, and again she realized that a year ago, while he had his sight, she would have been in no doubt. Yes, I know you. You would take nothing back, he said at length. But there is my point of view. Ethne looked at him with apprehension. Yes, she replied and she strove to speak with unconcern. Will you tell me it? Durrance assented, and began in the deliberate voice of a man who has thought out his subject, knows it by heart, and has decided, moreover, the order of words by which it will be most lucidly developed. I know what blindness means to all men, a growing, narrowing egotism unless one is perpetually on one's guard. And will one be perpetually on one's guard? Blindness means that to all men. 
he repeated emphatically, but it must mean more to me, who am deprived of every occupation. If I were a writer, I could still dictate. If I were a businessman, I could conduct my business. But I am a soldier, and not a clever soldier. Jealousy, a continual and irritable curiosity. There is no Paul Pry like your blind man. A querulous claim against your attention. These are my special dangers. And Ethne laughed gently in contradiction of his argument. Well, perhaps one may hold them off, he acknowledged. But they are to be considered. I have considered them. I am not speaking to you without thought. I have pondered and puzzled over the whole matter night after night since I got your letter, wondering what I should do. You know how gladly, with what gratitude, I would have answered you. Yes, let the marriage go on, if I dared, if I dared. But I think, don't you, that a great trouble rather clears one's wits. I used to lie awake at Cairo and think, and the unimportant trivial considerations gradually dropped away, and a few straight and simple truths stood out rather vividly. One felt that one had to cling to them, and with all one's might, because nothing else was left. Yes, that I do understand, Ethne replied in a low voice. She had gone through just such an experience herself. It might have been herself, and not Durance who was speaking. She looked up at him, and for the first time began to understand that, after all, she and he might have much in common. She repeated over to herself with an even firmer determination, Two lives shall not be spoilt because of me. Well, she asked, well, here's one of the very straight and simple truths. Marriage between a man crippled like myself, whose life is done, and a woman like you, active and young, whose life is in its flower, would be quite wrong unless each brought to it much more than friendship. It would be quite wrong if it implied a sacrifice for you. It implies no sacrifice, she answered firmly. Durance nodded. It was evident that the answer contented him, and Ethne felt that it was the intonation to which he listened rather than the words. His very attitude of concentration showed her that. She began to wonder whether it would be so easy, after all, to quiet his suspicions, now that he was blind. She began to realize that it might possibly, on that very account, be all the more difficult. Then do you bring more than friendship? he asked suddenly. You will be very honest, I know. Tell me. Ethne was in a quandary. She knew that she must answer, and at once, and without ambiguity. In addition, she must answer honestly. There is nothing, she replied, and as firmly as before, nothing in the world which I wish for so earnestly as that you and I should marry. It was an honest wish, and it was honestly spoken. She knew nothing of the conversation which had passed between Harry Faversham and Lieutenant Such in the gill room of the Criterion restaurant. She knew nothing of Harry's plans. She had not heard of the Gordon letters recovered from the mud wall of a ruined house in the city of the Dervishes on the Nile bank. Harry Feversham had, so far as she knew and meant, gone forever completely out of her life. Therefore, her wish was an honest one, but it was not an exact answer to Durance's question, and she hoped that again he would listen to the intonation rather than to the words. However, he seemed content with it. Thank you, Ethne he said, and he took her hand and shook it. His face smiled at her. He asked no other questions. There was not a doubt, she thought. His suspicions were quieted. He was quite content. And upon that, Mrs. Adair came with discretion into the room. She had the tact to greet Durrance as one who suffered under no disadvantage, and she spoke as though she had seen him only the week before. I suppose Ethne has told you of our plan, she said as she took her tea from her friend's hand. No, not yet, Ethne answered. What plan? asked Durrance. It is all arranged, said Mrs. Adair. You will want to go home to Gessens in Devonshire. I am your neighbor. A couple of fields separate us, that's all. So Ethne will stay with me during the interval before you are married. That's very kind of you, Mrs. Adair, Durrance exclaimed, because, of course, there will be an interval. A short one, no doubt, said Mrs. Adair. 
well it's this way if there's a chance that i may recover my sight it would be better that i should seize it at once time means a good deal in these cases then there is a chance cried ethne i am going to see a specialist here to-morrow durance answered and of course there's the oculus at weast baden but it may not be necessary to go so far i expect that i shall be able to stay at gesson's and come up to london when it is necessary thank you very much mrs adair it's a good plan and he added slowly from my point of view there could be no better ethne watched durrance drive away with his servant to his old rooms in st james street and stood by the window after he had gone in much the same attitude and absorption as that which had characterized her before he had come outside in the street the carriages were now coming back from the park and there was just one other change ethne's apprehensions had taken a more definite shape she believed that suspicion was quieted endurance for to-day at all events she had not heard his conversation with calder in cairo she did not know that he believed there was no cure which could restore him to sight she had no remotest notion that the possibility of a remedy might be a mere excuse but none the less she was uneasy durrance had grown more acute not only his senses had been sharpened that indeed was to be expected but trouble and thought had sharpened his mind as well it had become more penetrating she felt that she was entering upon an encounter of wits and she had a fear lest she would be worsted two lives shall not be spoilt because of me she repeated but it was a prayer now rather than a resolve for one thing she recognized quite surely durrance saw ever so much more clearly now that he was blind end of chapter 13、Chapter The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason, Chapter Fourteen. Captain Willoughby reappears. During the months of July and August, Ethne's apprehensions grew, and once at all events they found expression on her lips. "I am afraid," she said one morning as she stood in the sunlight at an open window of Mrs. Adair's house upon a creek of the Salcombe Estuary. In the room behind her, Mrs. Adair smiled quietly. Of what? That some accident happened to Colonel Durrance yesterday in London? No, Ethne answered slowly. Not of that, for he is at this moment crossing the lawn towards us. Again, Mrs. Adair smiled, but she did not raise her head from the book which she was reading, so that it might have been some passage in the book which so abused and pleased her. I thought so," she said, but in so low a voice that the words barely reached Ethne's ears. They did not penetrate to her mind, for as she looked across the stone-flagged terrace and down the broad, shallow flight of steps to the lawn, she asked abruptly, "Do you think he has any hope whatever that he will recover his sight?" The question had not occurred to Mrs. Adair before, and she gave to it now no importance in her thoughts. Would he travel up to town so often to see his oculus if he had none? She asked in reply. Of course he hopes. I'm afraid," said Ethne, and she turned with a sudden movement toward her friend. Haven't you noticed how quick he has grown and is growing, quick to interpret your silences, to infer what you do not say from what you do, to fill out your sentences, to make your movements the commentary of your words? Laura, haven't you noticed? At times, I think the very corners of my mind are revealed to him. He reads me like a child's lesson book. Yes," said Mrs. Adair. "You are at a disadvantage. You no longer have your face to screen your thoughts, and his eyes no longer tell me anything at all." Ethne added. There was truth in both remarks. So long as Durrance had had Ethne's face with its bright color and her steady. Frank, grey eyes visible before him, 
he could hardly weigh her intervals of silence and her movements against her spoken words with the detachment which was now possible to him on the other hand whereas before she had never been troubled by a doubt as to what he meant or wished or intended now she was often in the dark durrance's blindness in a word had produced an effect entirely opposite to that which might have been expected it had reversed their positions mrs adair however was more interested in ethne's unusual burst of confidence there was no doubt of it she reflected the girl once remarkable for a quiet frankness of word and look was declining into a creature of shifts and agitation there is something then to be concealed from him she asked quietly yes something rather important something which at all costs i must conceal ethne exclaimed and was not sure even while she spoke that durrance had not already found it out she stepped over the threshold of the window on to the terrace in front of her the lawn stretched to a hedge on the far side of that hedge a couple of grass fields lifted and fell in gentle undulations and beyond the field she could see amongst a cluster of trees the smoke from the chimneys of colonel durrance's house she stood for a little while hesitating upon the terrace on the left the lawn ran down to a line of tall beeches and oaks which fringed the creek but a broad space had been cleared to make a gap upon the bank so that ethne could see the sunlight on the water and the wooded slope on the farther side and a sailing boat some way down the creek tacking slowly against the light ethne looked about her as though she were summoning her resources and even composing her sentences ready for delivery to the man who was walking steadily towards her across the lawn if there was hesitation upon her part there was none at all she noticed on the part of the blind man it seemed that durrance's eyes looked in the path which his feet trod and with the stick which he carried in his hand he switched at the blades of grass like one that carries it from habit rather than for any use ethne descended the steps and advanced to meet him she walked slowly as if to a difficult encounter but there was another who only waited an opportunity to gauge in it with eagerness for as ethne descended the steps mrs adair suddenly dropped the book from which she had pretended to resume and ran towards the window hidden by the drapery of the curtain she looked out and watched the smile was still upon her lips but a fierce light had brightened in her eyes her face had the drawn look of hunger something which at all costs she must conceal she said to herself and she said it in a voice of exultation there was contempt too in her tone contempt for ethne eustace the woman of the open air who was afraid who shrank from marriage with a blind man and dreaded the restraint upon her freedom it was that shrinking which ethne had to conceal mrs adair had no doubt of it for my part i am glad she said and she was fiercely glad that blindness had disabled durrance for if her opportunity ever came as it seemed to her now more and more likely to come blindness reserved him to her as no man was ever reserved to any woman so jealous was she of his every word and look that his dependence upon her would be the extreme of pleasure she watched ethne and durrance meet on the lawn at the foot of the terrace steps she saw them turn and walk side by side across the grass towards the creek she noticed that ethne seemed to plead and in her heart she longed to overhear and ethne was pleading you saw your oculus yesterday she asked quickly as soon as they met well what did he say durrance shrugged his shoulders that one must wait only time can show whether a cure is possible or not he answered and then ethne bent forward a little and scrutinized his face as though she doubted that he had spoke the truth but must you and i wait she asked surely he returned 
it would be wiser on all counts and thereupon he asked her suddenly a question of which she did not see the drift it was mrs adair i imagine who proposed this plan that i should come home to gessens and that you should stay with her here across the fields ethne was puzzled by the question but she answered it directly and truthfully i was in great distress when i heard of your accident i was so distressed that at the first i could not think what to do i came to london and told laura since she is my friend and this was her plan of course i welcomed it with my heart and the note of pleading rang in her voice she was asking durrance to confirm her words and he understood that he turned towards her with a smile i know that very well ethne he said gently ethne drew a breath of relief and the anxiety passed for a little while from her face it was kind of mrs adair he resumed but it is rather hard on you who would like to be back in your own country i remember very well a sentence which harry feversham he spoke the name quite carelessly but paused just for a moment after he had spoken it no expression upon his face showed that he had any intention in so pausing but ethne suspected one he was listening she suspected for some movement of uneasiness perhaps of pain into which she might possibly be betrayed but she made no movement a sentence which harry feversham spoke a long while since he continued in london just before i left london for egypt he was speaking of you and he said she is of her country and more of her county i do not think she could be happy in any place which was not within reach of donegal and when i remember that it seems rather selfish that i should claim to keep you here at so much cost to you i was not thinking of that ethne exclaimed when i asked why we must wait that makes me out most selfish i was merely wondering why you preferred to wait why you insist upon it for of course although one hopes and prays with all one's soul that you will get your sight back the fact of a cure can make no difference she spoke slowly and her voice again had a ring of pleading this time durrance did not confirm her words and she repeated them with a greater emphasis it can make no difference durrance started like a man roused from an abstraction i beg your pardon ethany he said i was thinking at the moment of harry feversham there is something which i want you to tell me you said a long time ago at glenola that you might one day bring yourself to tell me and i should rather like to know now you see harry feversham was my friend i want you to tell me what happened that night at lennon house to break off your engagement to send him away an outcast ethne was silent for a while and then she said gently i would rather not it is all over and done with i don't want you to ask me ever durrance did not press for an answer in the slightest degree very well he said cheerily i won't ask you it might hurt you to answer and i don't want of course to cause you pain it's not on that account that i wish to say nothing ethne explained earnestly she paused and chose a word it isn't that i am afraid of any pain but what took place took place such a long while ago i look upon mr feversham as a man whom one has known well and who is now dead they were walking towards the wide gap in the line of trees upon the bank of the creek and as ethne spoke she raised her eyes from the ground she saw that the little boat which she had noticed tacking up the creek while she hesitated upon the terrace had run its nose into the shore the sail had been lowered the little pole mast stuck up above the grass bank of the garden and upon the bank itself a man was standing and staring vaguely towards the house as though not very sure of his ground a stranger has landed from the creek she said he looks as if he had lost his way i will go on and put him right she ran forward as she spoke seizing upon the stranger's presence as a means of relief even if the relief was only to last a minute such relief might be felt she imagined by a witness in a court when the judge rises for his half hour at lunch-time for the close 
of an interview with durrance left her continually with the sense that she had just stepped down from a witness box where she had been subjected to a cross-examination so deft that she could not quite clearly perceive its tendency although from the beginning she suspected it the stranger at the same time advanced to her he was a man of the middle size with a short snub nose a pair of vacuous protruding brown eyes and a moustache of some ferocity he lifted his hat from his head and disclosed a round forehead which was going bald i have sailed down from kingsbridge he said but i have never been in this part of the world before can you tell me if this house is called the pool yes and you will find mrs adair if you go up the steps on to the terrace said ethne i came to see miss eustace ethne turned back to him with surprise i am miss eustace the stranger contemplated her in silence so i thought he twirled first one mustache and then the other before he spoke again i have had some trouble to find you miss eustace i went all the way to glen Orla for nothing rather hard on a man whose leave is short i am sorry said ethne with a smile but why have you been put to this trouble again the stranger curled a mustache again his eyes dwelt vacantly upon her before he spoke you have forgotten my name no doubt by this time i do not think that i have ever heard it she answered ah yes you have believe me you heard it five years ago i am captain willoughby ethne grew sharply back the bright colour paled in her cheeks her lips set in a firm line and her eyes grew up very hard she glowered at him silently captain willoughby was not in the least degree decomposed he took his time to speak and when he did it was rather with the air of a man forgiving a breach of manners than of one making his excuses i can quite understand that you do not welcome me miss eustace but none of us could foresee that you would be present when the three white feathers came into feversham's hands ethne swept the explanation aside how do you know i was present she asked feversham told me you have seen him the cry leaped loudly from her lips it was just a throb of the heart made vocal it startled ethne as much as it surprised captain willoughby she had schooled herself to omit harry feversham from her thoughts and to obliterate him from her affections and the cry showed to her how incompletely she had succeeded only a few minutes since she had spoken of him as one whom she looked upon as dead and she had believed that she spoke the truth you have actually seen him she repeated in a wondering voice she gazed at her stolid companion with envy you have spoken to him and he to you when a year ago at suakin else why should i be here the question came as a shock to ethne she did not guess the correct answer she was not indeed sufficiently mistress of herself to speculate upon any answer but she dreaded it whatever it might be yes she said slowly and almost reluctantly after all why are you here willoughby took a letter case from his breast opened it with deliberation and shook out from one of its pockets into the palm of his hand a tiny soiled white feather he held it out to ethne i have come to give you this ethne did not take it in fact she positively shrank from it why she asked unsteadily three white feathers three separate accusations of cowardice were sent to feversham by three separate men this is actually one of those feathers which were forwarded from his lodgings to remington five years ago i am one of the three men who sent him i have come to tell you that i withdraw my accusation i take my feather back and you bring it to me he asked me to ethne took the feather in her palm a thing in itself so light and fragile and yet so momentous as a symbol and the trees and the garden began to whirl suddenly about her she was aware that captain willoughby was speaking but his voice had grown extraordinarily distant and thin so that she was annoyed since she wished very much to hear all that he had to say she felt very cold even upon that august day of sunlight 
but the presence of Captain Willoughby, one of the three men whom she never would forgive, helped her to command herself. She would give no exhibition of weakness before any one of the detested three, and with an effort she recovered herself when she was on the very point of swooning. Come, she said, I will hear your story. Your news was rather a shock to me. Even now I do not quite understand. She led the way from the open space to a little plot of grass above the creek. On three sides thick hedges enclosed it. At the back rose the tall elms and poplars. In front the water flashed and broke in ripples, and beyond the water the trees rose again and were overtopped by sloping meadows. A gap in the hedge made an entrance into this enclosure, and a garden seat stood in the center of the grass. Now, Ethne said, as she motioned to Captain Willoughby to take a seat at her side, you will take your time, perhaps. You will forget nothing, even his words, if you remember them. I shall thank you for his words. She held that white feather clenched in her hand. Somehow Harry Feversham had redeemed his honor. Somehow she had been unjust to him, and she was to learn how. She was in no hurry. She did not even feel one pang of remorse that she had been unjust. Remorse, no doubt, would come afterwards. At present, the mere knowledge that she had been unjust was too great a happiness to admit of abatement. She opened her hand and looked at the feather, and as she looked, memory sternly repressed for so long, regrets which she had thought stifled quite out of life, longings which had grown strange, filled all her thoughts. The Devonshire meadows were about her. The salt of the sea was in the air, but she was back again at the midst of that one season at Dublin during a spring five years ago, before the feathers came to Remelton. Willoughby began to tell a story, and almost at once even the memory of that season vanished. Ethne was in the most English of countries, the county of Plymouth and Dartmouth, and Brixton, and the Start, where the red cliffs of its coastline speak perpetually of dead centuries, so that one cannot put into any harbour without some thought of the Spanish main, and of the little barks and pinnaces which had ventured manfully out on their long voyages with the tide. Up this very creek the clink of the shipbuilder's hammers had rung, and the soil upon its banks was vigorous with the memories of British soldiers. But Ethne had no thought for these associations. The countryside was a shifting mist before her eyes, which now and then let through a glimpse of that strange wide country in the east, of which Durrance had so often told her. The only trees which she saw were the stunted mimosas of the desert, the only cliffs, the sharp pyramidal black rocks rising abruptly from its surface. It was part of the irony of her position that she was able so much more completely to appreciate the trials which one lover of hers had undergone through the confidences which had been made to her by the other. End of chapter 14「I will not interrupt you, said Ethne, as Willoughby took his seat beside her, and he had barely spoken a score of words before she broke that promise. I am Deputy Governor of Suakin, he began. My chief was on leave in May. You are fortunate enough not to know Suakin, Miss Eustace, particularly in May. No white woman can live in that town. It has a sodden, intolerable heat peculiar to itself. The air is heavy with brine. You can't sleep at night for its oppression. Well, I was sitting in the veranda on the first floor of the palace about ten o'clock at night, looking out over the harbor and the distillation works, and wondering whether it was worthwhile to go to bed at all. When a servant told me that the man, 
who refused to give his name, wished particularly to see me. The man was Feversham. There was only a lamp burning in the veranda, and the night was dark, so that I did not recognize him until he was close to me. At once, Ethne interrupted. How did he look? Willoughby wrinkled his forehead and opened his eyes wide. Really, I do not know, he said doubtfully. Much like other men, I suppose, who have been a year or two in the Sudan. A trifle overtrained and that sort of thing. Never mind, said Ethne, with a sigh of disappointment. For five years she had heard no word of Harry Feversham. She fairly hungered for news of him, for the sound of his habitual phrases, for the description of his familiar gestures. She had the woman's anxiety for his bodily health. She wished to know whether he had changed in face or figure, and, if so, how and in what measure. But she glanced at the obtuse, unobservant countenance of Captain Willoughby, and she understood that however much she craved these particulars, she must go without. I beg your pardon, she said. Will you go on? I asked him what he wanted, Willoughby resumed, and why he had not sent in his name. He would not have seen me if I had, he replied, and he drew a packet of letters out of his pocket. Now those letters, Miss Eustace, had been written a long while ago by General Gordon in Khartoum. They had been carried down the Nile as far as Berber. But the day after they reached Berber, that town surrendered to the Mahdists. Abu Fatma, the messenger who carried them, hid them in the wall of the house of an Arab called Yusef, who sold rock salt in the marketplace. Abu was then thrown into prison on suspicion and escaped to Suakin. The letters remained hidden in that wall until Feversham recovered them. I looked over them and saw that they were of no value, and I asked Feversham bluntly why he, who had once not dared to accompany his regiment on active service, had risked death and torture to get them back. Standing upon that veranda, with the quiet pool of water in front of him, Feversham had told his story quietly and without exaggeration. He had related how he had fallen in with Abu Fatma at Suakim, how he had planned the recovery of the letters how the two men had traveled together as far as Obak, and since Abu Fatma dared not go further, how he himself, driving his gray donkey, had gone on alone to Berber. He had not even concealed that access of panic which had loosened his joints when first he saw the low brown walls of the town and the towering date palms behind on the bank of the Nile, which had set him running and leaping across the empty desert in the sunlight a marrowless thing of fear. He made, however, one omission. He said nothing of the hours which he had spent crouching upon the hot sand, with his coat drawn over his head while he drew a woman's face toward him across the continents and seas, and nerved himself to endure by the look of sorrow which it wore. He went down into Berber at the setting of the sun, said Captain Willoughby, and it was all that he had to say. It was enough, however, for Ethne Eustace. She drew a deep breath of relief. Her face softened. There came a light into her gray eyes and a smile upon her lips. He went down into Berber, she repeated softly, and found that the old town had been destroyed by the orders of the emir, and that a new one was building upon its southern confines, continued Willoughby. All the landmarks by which Feversham was to know the house in which the letters were hidden had gone. The roofs had been torn off, the houses dismantled, the front walls carried away, narrow alleys of crumbling five courts. That is how Feversham described the place, crossing this way and that, and gaping to the stars. Here and there perhaps a broken tower rose up, and the remnant of a rich man's house but of any sign which could tell a man where the hut of Yusuf, who had once sold rock salt in the marketplace, had stood. There was no hope in those acres of crumbling mud. The foxes had already made the burrows there. The smile faded from Ethne's face, but she looked again at the white feather lying in her palm, and she laughed with a great contentment. It was yellow with the desert dust. It was a proof that in this story there was to be no word of failure. Go on, she said. 
Willoughby related the dispatch of the negro with the donkey to Abu Fatma at the wells of Wabak. Eversham stayed for a fortnight in Berber, Willoughby continued, a week during which he came every morning to the well and waited for the return of the negro from Obak, and a week during which that negro searched for Yusef, who had once sold rock salt in the marketplace. I doubt, Miss Eustace, if you can realize, however hard you try, what that fortnight must have meant to Feversham. The anxiety, the danger, the continued expectation that a voice would bid him to halt and a hand fall upon his shoulder, the urgent knowledge that if a hand fell, death would be the least part of his penalty. I imagine the town, a town of low houses and broad streets of sand, dug here and there into pits of mud wherewith to build the houses, and overhead the blistering sun and a hot shadowless sky. In no corner was there any darkness or concealment and all day a crowd jostled and shouted up and down these streets, for that is the Mahatma's policy to crowd the towns so that all may be watched and every other man may be his neighbor's spy. Feversham dared not seek the shelter of a roof at night, for he dared not trust his tongue. He could buy his food each day at the booths, but he was afraid of any conversation. He slept at night in some corner of the old deserted town, in the acres of the ruined five courts. For the same reason, he must not slink in the byways by day lest anyone should question him about his business, nor listen on the chance of hearing Yusef's name in the public places lest other loiters should joke with him and draw him into their talk. Nor dare he in the daylight prowl about those crumbled ruins. From sunrise to sunset, he must go quickly up and down the streets of the town like a man bent upon urgent business, which permits of no delay. And that continued for a fortnight, Miss Eustace. A weary, trying life, don't you think? I wish I could tell you of it as vividly as he told me that night upon the balcony of the palace at Suakin. Ethne wished it, too, with all her heart. Harry Feversham had made his story very real that night to Captain Willoughby, so that even after the lapse of fifteen months, this unimaginative creature was sensible of a contrast and a deficiency in the manner of his narration. In front of us was the quiet harbor and the Red Sea, above us the African stars. Feversham spoke in the quietest manner possible, but with a peculiar deliberation and with his eyes fixed upon my face, as though he was forcing me to feel with him and to understand. Even when he lighted his cigar, he did not avert his eyes for by this time I had given him a cigar and offered him a chair. I had really, I assure you, Miss Eustace. It was the first time in four years that he had sat with one of his equals, or indeed with any of his countrymen on a footing of equality. He told me so. I wish I could remember all that he told me. Willoughby stopped and cudgeled his brains helplessly. He gave up the effort in the end. Well, he resumed, after Feversham had skulked for a fortnight in Berber, the negro discovered Yusef, no longer selling salt, but tending a small plantation of dura on the river's edge. From Yusef, Feversham obtained particulars enough to guide him to the house where the letters were concealed in the inner wall. But Yusef was no longer to be trusted. Possibly Feversham's accent betrayed him. The more likely conjecture is that Yusef took Feversham for a spy and thought it wise to be beforehand and confess to Mohammed el Kier, the emir, his own share in the concealment of the letters. That, however, is a mere conjecture. The important fact is this. On the same night Feversham went alone to Old Berber. Alone, said Ethne. Yes. He found the house fronting a narrow alley and the sixth of the row. The front wall was destroyed, but the two side walls and the back wall still stood. Three feet from the floor and two feet from the right-hand corner, the letters were hidden in that inner wall. Feversham dug into the mud bricks with his knife. He made a hole wherein he could slip his hand. The wall was thick. He dug deep, stopping now and again to feel for the packet. At last, his fingers clasped and drew it out. As he hid it in a fold of his jibbeh, the light of a lantern shone upon him from behind. Ethne started as though she had been trapped herself. 
those acres of roofless five courts, with here and there a tower showing up against the sky, the lonely alleys, the dead silence here beneath the stars, the cries and the beating of drums and the glare of lights from the new town, Harry Feversham alone with the letters, with, and in a word, some portion of his honor redeemed, and finally the lantern flashing upon him in that solitary place. The scene itself and the progress of the incidents were so visible to Ethne at that moment that even with the feather in her open palm she could hardly bring herself to believe that Harry Feversham had escaped. Well, well, she asked. He was standing with his face to the wall. The light came from the alley behind him. He did not turn, but out of the corner of his eye he could see a fold of a white robe hanging motionless. He carefully secured the package, with a care indeed, and a composure which astonished him even at that moment. The shock had strung him to a concentration and lucidity of thought unknown to him till then. His fingers were trembling, he remarked, as he tied the knots, but it was with excitement, and an excitement which did not flurry. His mind worked rapidly, but quite coolly, quite deliberately. He came to a perfectly definite conclusion as to what he must do. Every faculty which he possessed was extraordinarily clear, and at the same time extraordinarily still. He had his knife in his hand. He faced about suddenly and ran. There were two men waiting. Feversham ran at the man who held the lantern. He was aware of the point of a spear. He ducked and beat it aside with his left arm. He leaped forward and struck with his right. The Arab fell at his feet. The lantern was extinguished. Feversham sprang across the white road body and ran eastward toward the open desert. But in no panic, he had never been so collected. He was followed by the second soldier. He had foreseen that he would be followed. If he was to escape, it was indeed necessary that he should be. He turned a corner, crouched behind a wall, and as the Arab came running by, he leaped out upon his shoulders. And again, as he leaped, he struck. Captain Willoughby stopped at this point of his story and turned toward Ethne. He had something to say which perplexed and at the same time impressed him, and he spoke with a desire for an explanation. The strangest feature of those few fierce short minutes, he said, was that Feversham felt no fear. I don't understand that, do you? From the first moment when the lantern shone upon him from behind, to the last when he turned his feet eastward and ran through the ruined alleys and broken walls toward the desert and the wells of Bobak, he felt no fear. This was the most mysterious part of Harry Feversham's story to Captain Willoughby. He was a man who so shrank from the possibilities of battle that he must actually send in his papers rather than confront them. Yet when he stood in dire and immediate peril, he felt no fear. Captain Willoughby might well turn to Ethne, for an explanation. There had been no mystery in it to Harry Feversham, but a great bitterness of spirit. He had sat on the veranda at Suakin, whittling away at the edge of Captain Willoughby's table with the very knife which he had used in Berber to dig out the letters, and which had proved so handy in a weapon when the lantern shone out behind him, the one glimmering point of light in that vast acreage of ruin. Harry Feversham had kept it carefully uncleansed of blood. He had treasured it all through his flight across the 240-odd miles of the desert into Suakin. It was, next to the white feathers, the thing which he held most precious of his possessions. And not merely because it would serve as a corroboration of his story to Captain Willoughby, but because the weapon enabled him to believe and realize it himself. A brown clotted rust dulled the whole length of the blade, and often during the first two days and nights of his flight, when he traveled alone, hiding and running and hiding again, with a dread of pursuit always at his heels, he had taken the knife from his breast and stared at it with incredulous eyes, and clutched it close to him like a thing of comfort. He had lost his way amongst the sand hills of Obak on the evening of the second day, and had wandered vainly with his small store of dates and water exhausted until he had stumbled and lay prone, parched and famished and enfeebled, with the bitter knowledge that Abu Fatma and the wells were somewhere within a mile of the spot on which he lay. But even at that moment of exhaustion, the knife had been a talisman and a help. He grasped the rough wooden handle, all too small for a western hand, 
and he ran his fingers over the rough rust upon the blade, and the weapon spoke to him and bade him to take heart. Since once he had been put to the test and had not failed. But long before he saw the white houses of Suakin, that feeling of elation vanished and the knife became an emblem of the vain tortures of his boyhood and the miserable folly which culminated in his resignation of his commission. He understood now the words which Lieutenant Such had spoken in the grill room of the Criterion restaurant when citing Hamlet as his example. The thing which he saw, which he thought over, which he imagined in the act and in the consequences that he shrank from, yet when the moment of action comes sharp and immediate, does he fail? And remembering these words, Harry Feversham sat one May night, four years afterward, in Captain Willoughby's veranda, whittling away at the table with his knife, and saying over and over again, in a bitter, savage voice, It was an illusion, but an illusion which caused a great deal of suffering to a woman I would have shielded from suffering. But I am well paid for it, for it has wrecked my life besides. Captain Willoughby could not understand any more than General Feversham could have understood, or than Ethne had. But Willoughby could at all events remember and repeat, and Ethne had grown by five years of unhappiness since the night when Harry Feversham in the little room off the hall at Linen House had told her of his upbringing, of the loss of his mother, of the impassable gulf between his father and himself, and of the fear of disgrace which had haunted his nights and disfigured the world for him by day. Yes, it was an illusion, she cried. I understand. I might have understood a long while since, but I would not. When those feathers came, he told me why they were sent, quite simply with his eyes on mine. When my father knew of them, he waited quite steadily and faced my father. There was other evidence of the like kind not within Ethne's knowledge. Harry Feversham had journeyed down to Broad Place in Surrey and made his confession no less unflinchingly to the old general. But Ethne knew enough. It was the possibility of cowardice from which he shrank, not the possibility of hurt, she exclaimed. If only one had been a little older, a little less sure about things, a little less narrow, I should have listened, I should have understood. At all events, I should not, I think, have been cruel. Not for the first time did remorse for that fourth feather which she had added to the three seize upon her. She sat now crushed by it into silence. Captain Willoughby, however, was a stubborn man, unwilling upon any occasion to admit an error. He saw that Ethne's remorse by implication condemned himself, and that he was not prepared to suffer. Yes, but these fine distinctions are a little too elusive for practical purposes, he said. You can't run the world on fine distinctions. So I cannot bring myself to believe that we three men were at all to blame. And if we were not, you of all people can have no reason for self-reproach. Ethne did not consider what he precisely meant by the last reference to herself. For as he leaned complacently back in his chair, Anger against him flamed suddenly hot in her. Occupied by his story, she had ceased to take stock of the storyteller. Now that he had ended, she looked him over from head to foot. An obstinate stupidity was the mark of the man to her eye. How dare he sit in judgment upon the meanest of his fellows, let alone Harry Feversham, she asked, and in the same moment recollected that she herself had endorsed his judgment. Shame tingled through all her blood. She sat with her lips set, keeping Willoughby under watch from the corners of her eyes and waiting to pounce savagely the moment he opened his lips. There had been noticeable throughout his narrative a manner of condescension towards Feversham. Let him use it again, thought Ethne. But Captain Willoughby said nothing at all, and Ethne herself broke the silence. Who of you three first thought of sending the feathers? She asked aggressively. Not you? No, I think it was Trench, he replied. Ah, Trench, Ethne exclaimed. She struck one clenched hand, the hand which held the feather, viciously into the palm of the other. I'll remember that name. But I share his responsibility, Willoughby assured her. 
I do not shrink from it at all. I regret very much that we cause you pain and annoyance, but I do not acknowledge to any mistake in this matter. I take my feather back now, and I annul my accusation, but that is your doing. Mine, asked Ethne, what do you mean? Captain Willoughby turned with surprise to his companion. A man may live in the Sudan and even yet not be wholly ignorant of women and their great quality of forgiveness. You gave the feathers back to Feversham in order that he might redeem his honor. That is evident. Ethne sprang to her feet before Captain Willoughby had come to the end of his sentence and stood a little in front of him with her face averted and in an attitude remarkably still. Willoughby, in his ignorance, like meaning another stupid man before him, had struck with a shrewdness and a vigor which he could never have compassed by the use of his wits. He had pointed out abruptly and suddenly to Ethne a way which she might have taken and had not, and her remorse warned her very clearly that it was the way which she ought to have taken. But she could rise to the heights. She did not seek to justify herself in her own eyes, nor would she allow Willoughby to continue in his misconception. She recognized that here she had failed in charity and justice, and she was glad that she had failed, since her failure had been the opportunity of greatness to Harry Feversham. Will you repeat what you said, she asked in a low voice, and ever so slowly, please. You gave the feathers back into Feversham's hand. He told you that himself? Yes, and Willoughby resumed. In order that he might, by his subsequent bravery, compel the men who sent them to take them back, and so redeem his honor. He did not tell you that? No, I guessed it. You see, Feversham's disgrace was, on the face of it, impossible to retrieve. The opportunity might never have occurred. It was not likely to occur. As things happened, Feversham still waited for three years in the bazaar at Suakin before it did. No, Miss Eustace, it needed a woman's faith to conceive that plan, a woman's encouragement to keep the man who undertook it to his work. Ethne laughed and turned back to him. Her face was tender with pride, and more than tender. Pride seemed in some strange way to hallow her, to give an unimagined benignance to her eyes, an unearthly brightness to the smile upon her lips and the color upon her cheeks, so that Willoughby looking at her was carried out of himself. Yes, he cried, you are the woman to plan this redemption. Ethne laughed again, and very happily. Did he tell you the fourth white feather, she asked? No. I shall tell you the truth, she said, and she resumed her seat. The plan was of his devising from first to last, nor did I encourage him to its execution for until today I never heard a word of it. Since the night of that dance in Donegal, I have had no message from Mr. Feversham and no news of him. I told him to take up those three feathers because they were his, and I wished to show him that I agreed with the accusations of which they were the symbols. That seems cruel, but I did more. I snapped a fourth white feather from my fan and gave him that to carry away too. It is only fair that you should know. I wanted to make an end for ever and ever, not only of my acquaintanceship with him, but of every kindly thought he might keep of me, of every kindly thought I might keep of him. I wanted to be sure myself, and I wanted him to be sure, that we should always be strangers now and afterwards. And the last words she spoke in a whisper. Captain Willoughby did not understand what she meant by them. It is possible that only Lieutenant Such and Harry Feversham himself would have understood. I was sad and sorry enough when I had done it, she resumed. Indeed, indeed, I think I have always been sorry since. I think that I have never at any minute during these five years quite forgotten that fourth white feather and the quiet air of dignity with which he took it. But today I'm glad. And her voice, though low, rang rich with the fullness of her pride. Oh, very glad, for this was his thought, his deed. They are both all his, as I would have them be. I had no share, and of that I am very proud. He needed no woman's faith, no woman's encouragement, 
yet he sent this back to you, said Willoughby, pointing in some perplexity to the feather which Ethne held. Yes, she said, yes. He knew that I should be glad to know. And suddenly she held it close to her breast. Thus she sat for a while with her eyes shining, until Willoughby rose to his feet and pointed to the gap in the hedge by which they had entered the enclosure. By Jove, Jack Durrance, he exclaimed. Durrance was standing in the gap, which was the only means of entering or going out. End of chapter 15、Chapter、16 o f The Four Feathers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. Chapter 16 Captain Willoughby Retires. Ethne had entirely forgotten even Colonel Durrance's existence. From the moment when Captain Willoughby had put that Little soil feather, which had once been white and was now yellow, into her hand, she had no thought for any one but Harry Feversham. She had carried Willoughby into that enclosure, and his story had absorbed her and kept her memory on the rack as she filled out with this or that recollected details of Harry's gestures or voice or looks, the deficiencies in her companion's narrative. She had been swept away from that august garden of sunlight and coloured flowers, and those five most weary years during which she had held her head high and greeted the world with a smile of courage were blotted from her existence. How weary they had been, perhaps she never knew, until she raised her head and saw Durrance at the entrance of the hedge. Hush, she said to Willoughby, and her face paled and her eyes shut tight for a moment. With a spasm of pain, but she had no time to spare for any indulgence of her feelings. Her few minutes' talk with Captain Willoughby had been a holiday, but the holiday was over. She must take up again the responsibilities with which those five years had charged her, and at once. If she could not accomplish that hard task of forgetting, and she now knew very well that she never would accomplish it, she must do the next best thing. And give no sign that she had not forgotten. Durrance must continue to believe that she brought more than friendship into the marriage account. He stood at the very entrance to the enclosure. He advanced into it. He was so quick to guess. It was not wise that he should meet Captain Willoughby or even know of his coming. Ethne looked about her for an escape, knowing very well that she would look in vain. The creek was in front of them, and three walls. Of high thick hedge girt them in behind and at the sides. There was but one entrance to this enclosure, and Durrance himself barred the path to it. Keep still, she said in a whisper. You know him? Of course, we were together for three years of Swakin. I heard that he had gone blind. I am glad to know that it is not true. This he said, noticing the freedom of Durrance's gait. Speak lower, returned Ethne. It is true, he is blind. One would never have thought it. Consolation seemed so futile. What can I say to him? Say nothing. Durrance was still standing just within the enclosure and, as it seemed, looking straight towards the two people seated on the bench. Ethne, he said, rather than called, and the quiet, unquestioning voice made the illusion that he saw extraordinarily complete. It's impossible that he is blind, said Willoughby. He sees us. He sees nothing. Again Durrance called Ethne, but now in a louder voice and a voice of doubt. Do you hear? He is not sure, whispered Ethne. Keep very still. Why? He must not know you are here, and lest Willoughby should move, she caught his arm tight in her hand. Willoughby did not pursue his inquiries. Ethne's manner constrained him to silence. She sat very still as she wished him to sit, and in a queer, huddled attitude, she was even holding her breath. She was staring at Durrance with a great fear in her eyes. Her face was strained forward, and not a muscle of it moved, so that Willoughby, as he looked at her, was conscious of a certain excitement 
which grew on him for no reason but her remarkable apprehension. He began unaccountably himself to fear lest he and she should be discovered. He is coming towards us, he whispered. Not a word, not a movement. Ethne, Durrance cried again. He advanced further into the enclosure and towards the seat. Ethne and Captain Willoughby sat rigid, watching him with their eyes. He passed in front of the bench and stopped, actually facing them. Surely, thought Willoughby, he sees. His eyes were upon them. He stood easily, as though he were about to speak. Even Ethne, though she very well knew that he did not see, began to doubt her knowledge. Ethne, he said again, and this time in the quiet voice which he had first used. But since again no answer came, he shrugged his shoulders and turned towards the creek. His back was towards them now, but Ethne's experience had taught her to appreciate almost indefinable signs in his bearing, since nowadays his face showed her so little. Something in his attitude, in the poise of his head, even in the carelessness with which he swung his stick, told her that he was listening, and listening with all his might. A grasp tightened on Willoughby's arm. Thus they remained for the space of a minute, and then Durrance turned suddenly and took a quick step towards the seat. Ethne, however, by this time knew the man and his ingenuities. She was prepared for some such unexpected movement. She did not stir. There was not audible the merest rustle of a skirt, and her grip still constrained Willoughby. I wonder where in the world she can be, said Durrance to himself aloud, and he walked back and out of the enclosure. Ethne did not free Captain Willoughby's arm until Durrance had disappeared from sight. That was a close shave, Willoughby said, when at last he was allowed to speak. Suppose that Durrance had sat down on the top of us. Why suppose, since he did not, Ethne asked calmly. You have told me everything, so far as I remember. And all that you have told me happened in the spring, the spring of last year, said Willoughby. Yes, I want to ask you a question. Why did you not bring this feather to me last summer? Last year my leave was short. I spent it in the hills north of Sorkin, after Ibex. I see, Ethne said quietly. I hope you had good sport. It wasn't bad. Last summer Ethne had been free. If Willoughby had come home with his good news instead of shooting Ibex on Jebel Araft, it would have made all the difference in her life, and the cry was loud at her heart. Why didn't you come? But outwardly she gave no sign of the irreparable harm which Willoughby's delay had brought about. She had the self-command of a woman who had been sorely tried, and she spoke so unconcernedly that Willoughby believed her questions, prompted by the merest curiosity. You might have written, she suggested, Feversham did not suggest that there was any hurry. It would have been a long and difficult matter to explain in a letter. He asked me to go to you when I had an opportunity, and I had no opportunity before. To tell the truth, I thought it was very likely that I might find Feversham had come back before me. Oh, no, returned Ethne. There could be no possibility of that. The other two feathers still remain to be redeemed before he will ask me to take back mine. Willoughby shook his head. Feversham can never persuade Castleton and Trench to cancel their accusations as he persuaded me. Why not? Major Castleton was killed when the square was broken at Tamai. Killed, cried Ethne, and she laughed in a short and satisfied way. Willoughby turned and stared at her, disbelieving the evidence of his ears, but her face showed him quite clearly that she was thoroughly pleased. Ethne was a Celt, and she had the Celt of feelings that death was not a very important matter. She could hate, too, and she could be hard as iron to the men she hated, and these three men she hated exceedingly. It was true that she had agreed with them, that she had given a feather, the fourth feather, to Harry Feversham, just to show that she agreed, but she did not trouble her head about that. She was very glad to hear that Major Castleton was out of the world and done with. And Colonel Trench, too, she said. No, Willoughby answered. You are disappointed, but he is even worse off than that. He was captured when engaged on a reconnaissance. He is now a prisoner in Omdurman. 
Ah, said Ethne, I don't think you can have any idea, said Willoughby severely, of what captivity in Omdurman implies. If you had, however much you disliked the captive, you would feel some pity. Not I, said Ethne stubbornly. I will tell you something of what it does imply. No, I don't wish to hear of Colonel Trent's. Besides, you must go. I want you to tell me one thing first, said she, as she rose from her seat. What became of Mr. Feversham after he had given you that feather? I told him that he had done everything which could be reasonably expected, and he accepted my advice. For he went on board the first steamer which touched at Swakin, on its way to Suez, and so left the Sudan. I must find out where he is. He must come back. Did he need money? No, he still drew his allowance from his father. He told me that he had more than enough. I am glad of that, said Ethne, and she bade Willoughby wait within the enclosure until she returned and went out by herself to see that the way was clear. The garden was quite empty. Durrance had disappeared from it, and the great stone terrace of the house and the house itself with its striped sunblinds looked a place of sleep. It was getting towards one o'clock, and the very birds were quiet among the trees. Indeed, the quietude of the garden struck upon Ethne's senses as something almost strange. Only the bees hummed drowsily about the flower beds, and a voice of a lad was heard calling from the slopes of meadow on the far side of the creek. She returned to Captain Willoughby. You can go now, she said. I cannot pretend friendship for you, Captain Willoughby, but it was kind of you to find me out and tell me your story you are going back at once to kingsbridge i hope so for i do not wish colonel durrance to know of your visit or anything of what you have told me durrance was a friend of feversham's his great friend willoughby objected he is quite unaware that any feathers were sent to mr feversham so there is no need he should be informed that one of them has been taken back ethne answered he does not know why my engagement to mr feversham was broken off i do not wish him to know your story would enlighten him and he must not be enlightened why asked willoughby he was obstinate by nature and he meant to have the reason for silence before he promised to keep it ethne gave it to him at once very simply i am engaged to colonel durrance she said it was a fear that Durrance already suspected that no stronger feeling than friendship attached her to him. And once he heard that the fault which broke her engagement to Harry Feversham had been most bravely atoned, there could be no doubt as to the course which he would insist upon pursuing. He would strip himself of her. The one thing left to him, and that she was stubbornly determined he should not do, she was bound to him in honour, and it would be a poor way of manifesting her joy that Harry Feversham had redeemed his honour if she stayed away, sacrificed her own. Captain Willoughby pursed his lips and whistled. Engaged to Jack Durrance? he exclaimed. Then I seem to have wasted my time in bringing you that feather, and he pointed towards it. She was holding it in her open hand, and she drew her hand sharply away, as though she feared for a moment and he meant to rob her of it. I am most grateful for it, she returned. It's a bit of a muddle, isn't it, Willoughby remarked. It seems a little tough on Feversham, perhaps. It's a little rough on Jack Durrance, too, when you come to think of it. Then he looked at Ethne. He noticed a careful handling of the feather. He remembered something of the glowing look with which she had listened to his story, something of the eager tones in which she had put her question and he added i shouldn't wonder if it was rather rough on you too miss eustace ethne did not answer him and they walked together out of the enclosure towards the spot where willoughby had moored his boat she had hurried him down the bank to the water's edge intent that he should sail away unperceived but ethne had counted without mrs adair who all that morning had seen much in ethne's movements to interest her from the drawing-room window she had watched ethne and durrance meet at the foot of the terrace steps she had seen them walk together towards the estuary towards the estuary 
she had noticed willoughby's boat as it ran aground in the wide gap between the trees she had seen a man disembark and ethne go forward to meet him mrs adair was not the woman to leave her post of observation at such a moment and from the cover of the curtains she continued to watch with all the curiosity of a woman in a village who draws down the blind that unobserved she may get a better peep at the stranger passing down the street ethne and the man from the boat turned away and disappeared among the trees leaving durrance forgotten and alone mrs adair thought at once of that enclosure at the water's edge the conversation lasted for some while and since the couple did not promptly reappear a question flashed into her mind could the stranger could the stranger be harry feversham ethne had no friends in this part of the world the question pressed upon mrs adair she longed for an answer and of course for that particular answer which would convict ethne eustace of duplicity her interest grew into excitement when she saw durrance tired of waiting follow upon ethne's steps but what came after was to interest her still more durrance reappeared to her supplies alone and came straight to the house up the terrace into the drawing-room have you seen ethne he asked is she not in the little garden by the water mrs adair asked no i went into it and called to her it was empty indeed said mrs adair then i don't know where she is are you going yes home mrs adair made no effort to detain him at that moment perhaps you will come in and dine to-night eight o'clock thanks very much i shall be pleased said durrance but he did not immediately go he stood by the window idly swinging to and fro the tassel of the blind i did not know until to-day that it was your plan that i should come home and ethne stay with you until i found out whether a cure was likely or possible it was very kind of you mrs adair and i am grateful it was a natural plan to propose as soon as i heard of your ill luck and when was that he asked unconcernedly the day after calder's telegram reached her from Gaddafi halfa i suppose mrs adair was not deceived by his attitude of carelessness she realized that his expression of gratitude had deliberately led up to this question oh so you know of that telegram she said i thought you did not for ethne had asked her not to mention it on the very day when durrance returned to england of course i knew it he returned and without waiting any longer for an answer he went out on to the terrace mrs adair dismissed for the moment the mystery of the telegram she was occupied by a conjecture that in the little garden by the water's edge durrance had stood and called aloud for ethne while within twelve yards of him perhaps actually within his reach she and someone else had kept very still and had given no answer her conjecture was soon proved true she saw ethne and her companion come out again on to the open lawn was it feversham she must have an answer to that question she saw them descend the bank towards the boat and stepping from a window ran thus it happened that as willoughby rose from loosening the painter he saw mrs adair's disappointed eyes gazing into his mrs adair called to ethne who stood by captain willoughby and came down to the bank to them i notice you crossed the lawn from the drawing-room window she said yes answered ethne and she said no more mrs adair however did not move away and an awkward pause followed ethne was forced to give in i am talking to captain willoughby and she turned to him you do not know mrs adair i think no he replied as he raised his hat but i know mrs adair very well by name i know friends of yours mrs adair durrance for instance and of course i knew a glance from ethne brought him abruptly to a stop he began vigorously to push the nose of his boat from the sand course what asked mrs adair with a smile course i knew of you mrs adair mrs adair was quite clear that this was not what willoughby had been on the point of saying when ethne turned her eyes quietly upon him and cut him short 
he was on the point of adding another name captain willoughby she repeated to herself then she said you belong to colonel durrance's regiment perhaps no i belong to the north surrey he answered ah mr feversham's old regiment said mrs adair pleasantly captain willoughby had fallen into a little trap with a guilelessness which provoked in her a desire for a closer acquaintance whatever willoughby knew it would be easy to extract ethne however had disconcertingly ways which at times left mrs adair at a loss she looked now straight into mrs adair's eyes and said calmly captain willoughby and i have been talking of mr feversham at the same time she held out her hand to the captain good-bye she said mrs adair hastily interrupted colonel durrance has gone home but he dines with us to-night i came out to tell you that but i am glad that i came for it gives me the opportunity to ask your friend to lunch with us if he will captain willoughby who already had one leg over the bow of his boat withdrew it with alacrity it's awful good of you mrs adair he began it is very kind indeed ethne continued but captain willoughby has reminded me that his leave is very short and we have no right to detain him good-bye captain willoughby gazed with a vain appeal upon miss eustace he had travelled all night from london he had made the scantiest breakfast at kingsbridge and the notion of lunch appealed to him particularly at that moment but her eyes rested on his with a quiet and inexorable command he bowed got ruefully into his boat and pushed off from the shore it's a little rough on me too perhaps miss eustace he said ethne laughed and returned to the terrace with mrs adair once or twice she opened the palm of her hand and disclosed to her companion's view a small white feather at which she laughed again and with a clear and rather low laugh which she gave no explanation of captain willoughby's errand had she been in mrs adair's place she would not have expected one it was her business and only hers end of chapter sixteen Chapter 17 of The Four Feathers by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Mussolini Overture. Mrs. Adair, on her side, asked for no explanations. She was naturally, behind her pale and placid countenance, a woman of a torturous and intriguing mind. She preferred to look through a keyhole, even when she could walk straight in at the door, and knowledge which could be gained by a little maneuvering was always more desirable and precious in her eyes than any information which a simple question would elicit. She avoided, indeed, the direct question on a perverted sort of principle, and she thought a day very well spent if, at the close of it, she had outwitted a companion into telling her spontaneously some trivial and unimportant piece of news which a straightforward request would have at once secured for her at breakfast time therefore though she was mystified by the little white feather upon which ethne seemed to set so much store and wondered at the good news of harry feversham which captain willoughby had brought and vainly puzzled her brain in conjecture as what in the world could have happened on that night at ramelton so many years ago she betrayed nothing whatever of her perplexity all through lunch on the contrary she plied her guest with conversation upon indifferent topics mrs adair could be good company when she chose and she chose now but it was not to any purpose i don't believe that you hear a single word i am saying she exclaimed ethne laughed and pleaded guilty she betook herself to her room as soon as lunch was finished and allowed herself an afternoon of solitude sitting at her window she repeated slowly the story which willoughby had told her that morning and her heart thrilled to it as to the music divinely played 
the regret that he had not come home and told it a year ago when she was free was a small thing in comparison with the story itself it could not outweigh the great gladness which that brought to her it had indeed completely vanished from her thoughts a pride which had never recovered from the blow which harry feversham had dealt to her in the hall at lennon house and by the man who had dealt the blow she was aglow with it and most grateful to harry feversham for that he had at so much peril to himself restored it she was conscious of a new exhilaration in the sunlight of a quicker pulsation in her blood a youth was given back to her upon that august afternoon ethne unlocked a drawer in her dressing-case and took from it the portrait which alone of all harry feversham's presence she had kept she rejoiced that she had kept it it was the portrait of some one who was dead to her that she knew very well for there was no thought of disloyalty towards durrance in her breast but the some one was a friend she looked at it with a great happiness and contentment because harry feversham had needed no expression of faith from her to inspire him and no encouragement from her to keep him through the years on the level of his high inspiration when she put it back again she laid the white feather in the drawer with it and locked the two things up together she came back to a window out upon the lawn a light breeze made the shadows from the high trees dance the sunlight mellowed and reddened but ethne was of her country as harry feversham had long ago discovered and her heart yearned for it at this moment it was the month of august the first of the heather would be out upon the hillsides of donegal and she wished that the good news had been brought to her there the regret that it had not was not her crumpled rose leaf here she was in a strange land there the brown mountains with their outcroppings of granite and the voices of the streams would have shared she almost thought in her new happiness great sorrows and great joys had this in common for ethne eustace they both drew her homewards since their endurance was more easy and gladness more complete she had however one living tie with donegal at her side for Dermard's old collie dog had become her inseparable companion. To him she bade her confidence, and if at times her voice broke in tears, why the dog would not tell her. She came to understand much which Willoughby had omitted and which Feverson had never told. Those three years of concealment in the small and crowded city of Swekin for instance with the troops marching out to battle and returning dust-strewn and bleeding and laurelled with victory harry feversham had to slink away at their approach lest some old friend of his durrance perhaps or willoughby or trench should notice him and penetrate his disguise the panic which had beset him when first he saw the dark brown walls of berber the night in the ruined acres the stumbling search for the well amongst the shifting sand hills of Obak. Ethne had vivid pictures of these incidents, and as she thought of each, she asked herself, Where was I then? What was I doing? She sat in a golden mist until the lights began to change upon the still water of the creek, and the rooks reeled noisily out from the treetops to sort themselves for the night and warned her of evening she brought to the dinner-table that night a buoyancy of spirit which surprised her companions mrs adair had to admit that seldom had her eyes shone so starrily or the colour so freshly graced her cheeks she was more than ever certain that captain willoughby had brought stirring news she was more than ever tortured by her vain effort to guess at its nature but mrs adair in spite of her perplexities took her share in the talk, and that dinner passed with a freedom from embarrassment unknown since Durrance had come home to Gessens, for he too threw off a burden of restraint. His spirits rose to match Ethne's. He answered laugh with laugh, 
and from his face that habitual look of tension the look of a man listening with all his might that his ears might make good the loss of his eyes passed altogether away you will play on your violin tonight i think he said with a smile as they rose from the table yes she answered i will with all my heart durrance laughed and held open the door the violin remained locked in its case during these last two months durrance had come to look upon that violin as a gauge and test if the world was going well with ethne the case was unlocked the instrument was allowed to speak if the world went ill it was kept silent lest it should say too much and open old wounds and lay them bare to other eyes ethne herself knew it for an indiscreet friend but it was to be brought out tonight mrs adair lingered until ethne was out of earshot you have noticed a change in her tonight she said yes have i not answered durrance one has waited for it hoped for it despaired of it are you so glad of the change durrance threw back his head do you wonder that i am glad kind friendly unselfish these things she has always been but there is more than friendliness evident tonight, and for the first time it's evident. There came a look of pity upon Mrs. Adair's face, and she passed out of the room without another word. Durrance looked at her. Durrance took all of that great change in Anthony to himself. Mrs. Adair drew up the blinds of the drawing room, opened the window, and let the moonlight in, and then, as she saw Ethne unlocking the case of her violin, she went out on to the terrace. She felt that she could not sit patiently in her company, so that when Durrance entered the drawing room, he found Ethne alone there. She was seated in the window, and already tightening the strings of her violin. Durrance took a chair behind her in the shadows. "'What shall I play for you?' she asked. The Mussolini Overture, he answered. You played it on the first evening when I came to Ramelton. I remember so well how you played it then. Play it again tonight. I want to compare. I have played it since. Never to me. They were alone in the room. The window stood open. It was a night of moonlight. Ethne suddenly crossed to the lamp and put it out. She resumed the seat while Durrance remained in the shadow leaning forward with his hands upon his knees listening but with an intentness of which he had given no sign that evening he was applying as he thought a final test upon which his life and hers should be decided ethne's violin would tell him assuredly whether he was right or no would friendship speak from it or the something more than friendship ethne played the overture and as she played she forgot that durrance was in the room behind her in the garden the air was still and summer warm and fragrant on the creek the moonlight lay like a solid floor of silver the trees stood dreaming to the stars and as the music floated loud out across the silent lawn ethne had a sudden fancy that it might perhaps travel down the creek and over the Salcombe bar and across the moonlight seas and strike small yet wonderfully clear like fairy music upon the ears of a man sleeping somewhere far away beneath the brightness of the southern stars with the cool night wind of the desert blowing upon his face if he could only hear she thought if he could only wake and know that what he heard was a message of friendship and with this fancy in her mind she played with such skill as she had never used before she made of a violin a voice of sympathy the fancy grew and changed as she played the music became a bridge swung in mid-air across the world upon which just for these few minutes she and harry feversham might meet and shake hands they would separate of course forthwith and each one go upon the allotted way but these few minutes would be a help to both along the separate ways the chords rang upon silence it seemed to ethne they declaimed the pride which had come to her that day a fancy grew into a belief it was no longer if he should hear but he must hear 
and so carried away was she from the discretion of thought that a strange hope suddenly sprang up and enthralled her if he could answer she lingered upon the last bars waiting for the answer and when the music had died down to silence she sat with a violin upon her knees looking eagerly out across the moonlight garden and an answer did come but it was not carried up the creek and across the lawn it came from the dark shadow of the room behind her and it was spoken through the voice of durrance ethne where do you think i heard that overture last played ethne was roused with a start to the consciousness that durrance was in the room and she answered like one shaken suddenly out of sleep why you told me at ramelton when you first came to lennon house i have heard it since though it was not played by you it was not really played at all but a melody of it not even that really but a suggestion of a melody i heard stumble out upon a zither with many false notes by a greek in a bare little whitewashed cafe lit by one glaring lamp at wadi halfa this overture she said how strange not so strange after all for the greek was harry feversham so the answer had come ethne had no doubt that it was an answer she sat very still in the moonlight only had any one bent over her with eyes to see he would have discovered that her eyelids were closed there followed a long silence she did not consider why durrance having kept this knowledge secret so long should speak of it now she did not ask what harry feversham was doing that he must play the zither in a mean cafe at wadi halfa but it seemed to her that he had spoken to her as she to him the music had after all been a bridge it was not even strange that he had used durrance's voice wherewith to speak to her when was this she asked at length in february of this year i will tell you about it yes please tell me and durrance spoke out of the shadows of the room end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the four feathers by a e w mason this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Answer to the Overture Ethne did not turn towards Durrance or move at all from her attitude. She sat with her, violin upon her knees, looking across the moonlight garden to the band of silver in the gap of the trees, and she kept her position deliberately for it helped her to believe that Harry Feversham himself was speaking to her she was able to forget that he was speaking through the voice of durrance she almost forgot that durrance was even in the room she listened with durrance's own intentness and anxious that the voice should speak very slowly so that the message might take a long time in the telling and she gather it all jealously to her heart it was on the night before i started eastward into the desert for the last time said durrance and the deep longing and regret with which he dwelt upon that last time for once left ethne quite untouched yes she said that was in february the middle of the month wasn't it do you remember the day i should like to know the exact day if you can tell me the fifteenth said durrance and ethne repeated the date meditatively i was at glenalla all february she said what was i doing on the fifteenth it does not matter she had felt a queer sort of surprise all the time when willoughby was telling his story that morning that she had not known by some instinct of these incidents at the actual moment of their occurrence the surprise returned to her now it was strange that she should have had to wait for this august night and this summer garden of moonlight and closed flowers before she learned of the meeting between feversham and durrance on february fifteenth and heard the message and the remorse came to her because of that delay it was my own fault she said to herself if i had kept my faith in him i should have known at once i am well punished 
it did not at all occur to her that the message could convey any but the best of news it would carry on the good tidings which she had already heard it would enlarge and complete so that this day might be rounded to perfection of this she was quite sure well she said go on i have been busy all day in my office finishing up my work i turned the key in the door at ten o'clock thinking with relief that for six weeks i should not open it and i strolled northward out of the wadi halfa along the nile bank into the little town of tufike as i entered the main street i saw a small crowd arabs negroes a greek or two and some egyptian soldiers standing outside the cafe and lit up by a glare of light from within as i came nearer i heard the sound of a violin and a zither but most vilely played jingling out a waltz i stood at the back of the crowd and looked over the shoulders of the men in front of me into the room it was a place of four bare whitewashed walls a bar stood in one corner a wooden bench or two were ranged against the walls and a single unshaded paraffin lamp swung and glared from the ceiling a troop of itinerant musicians were playing to that crowd of negroes and arabs and egyptians for a night's lodging and the price of a meal there were four of them and so far as i could see all four were greeks two were evidently man and wife they were both old both slatternly and almost in rags the man a thin sallow-faced fellow with gray hair and a black mustache the woman fat coarse of face unwieldy of body of the other two one it seemed must be their daughter a girl of seventeen and not good-looking really but dressed and turned out with a scrupulous care which in those sordid and mean surroundings lent her good looks the care indeed with which she was dressed assured me she was their daughter and to tell the truth i was rather touched by the thought that the father and mother would go in rags so that she at all costs might be trim a clean ribbon bound back her hair an untorn frock of some white stuff clothed her tidily even her shoes were neat the fourth was a young man he was seated in the window with his back towards me bending over his zither but i could see that he wore a beard when i came up the old man was playing the violin though playing it is not indeed the word the noise he made was more like the squeaking of a pencil on a slate it set one's teeth on edge the violin itself seemed to squeal with pain and while he fiddled and the young man hammered at his zither the old woman and girl slowly revolved in a waltz it may sound comic to hear about it but if you could have seen it fairly plucked at one's heart i do not think that i have ever in my life witnessed anything quite so sad the little crowd outside negroes mind you laughing at the troop passing clumsy heavy-footed shining with heat lumbering round slowly panting with her exertions the girl lissom and young the two men with their discordant torturing music and just above you the great planets and stars of an african sky and just about you the great silent and spacious dignity of the moonlit desert imagine it the very ineptness of the entertainment actually hurt one he paused for a moment while ethne pictured to herself the scene which he had described she saw harry feversham bending over the, his zither she saw harry feversham bending over his zither and at once she asked herself what was he doing with that troop it was intelligible enough that he would not care to return to england it was certain that he would not come back to her unless she sent for him and she knew from what captain willoughby had said that he expected no message from her he had not left with willoughby the name of any place where a letter could reach him but what was he doing at wadi halfa masquerading with this itinerant troop he had money so much willoughby had told her you spoke to him she asked suddenly to whom oh to harry returned to us yes afterwards when i found out it was he who was playing the zither 
Yes, and how did you find out? Ethne asked. The waltz came to an end. The old woman sank exhausted upon the bench against the whitewashed wall. The young man raised his head from his zither. The old man scraped a new chord upon his violin, and the girl stood forward to sing. Her voice had youth and freshness, but no other quality of music. Her singing was as inept as the rest of the entertainment. Yet the old man smiled. The mother beat time with a heavy foot and nodded at her husband with pride in their daughter's accomplishment. And again in the throng, the ill-conditioned talk, the untranslatable jests of the Arabs and the Negroes went their round. It was horrible, don't you think? Yes, answered Ethne, but slowly in an absent voice. As she had felt no sympathy for Durrance when he began to speak, so she had none to spare for these three outcasts of fortune. She was too absorbed in the mystery of, of Harry Feversham's presence at Wadi Hoffa. She was listening too closely for the message which he sent to her, though through the open window the moon threw a broad panel of silver light upon the floor of the room close to her feet. She sat gazing into it as she listened, as though it was itself a window through which, if she looked but hard enough, she might see, very small and far away, that lighted cafe blazing upon the street of the little town of Tufaike on the frontier of the Sudan. Well, she asked, and after the song was ended, the young man with his back towards me, Durant, resumed began to fumble out a solo upon the zither. He struck so many false notes, no tune was to be apprehended at first. The laughter and noise grew amongst the crowd, and I was just turning away, rather sick at heart, when some notes, a succession of notes, played correctly by chance, suddenly arrested me. I listened again, and sort of haunting melody began to emerge. A weak, thin thing, with no soul in it, a ghost of a melody, and yet familiar. I stood listening in a street of sand, between the hovels fringed by a row of stunted trees, and I was carried away out of the east to Ramelton, and to a summer night beneath the melting sky of Donegal, when you sat by the open window, as you sit now, and played the Mousseline Overture, which you were played again tonight. It was a melody from this overture, she exclaimed. Yes, and it was Harry Feversham who played the melody. I did not guess it at once. I was not very quick in those days. But you are now, said Ethne, quicker. At all events, I should have guessed it now. Then, however, I was only curious. I wondered how it was that an itinerant Greek came to pick up the tune. At all events, I determined to reward him for his diligence. I thought that you would like me to. Yes, said Ethne in a whisper. So, when he came out from the cafe, and with his hat in his hand passed through the jeering crowd, I threw a sovereign into the hat. He turned to me with a start of surprise. In spite of his beard, I knew him. Besides, before he could check himself, he cried out, Jack, you can have made no mistake then said ethne in a wondering voice no the man who strummed upon the zither was the christian name was upon her lips but she had the wit to catch it back unuttered was mr feversham but he knew no music i remember very well she laughed with a momentary recollection of feversham's utter inability to appreciate any music except that which she herself evoked from her violin he had no ear. You couldn't invent a discord harsh enough even to attract his attention. He could never have remembered any melody from the Mousseline Overture. Yet it was Harry Feversham, he answered. Somehow he had remembered. I can understand it. He would have so little he cared to remember, and that little he would have striven with all his might to bring clearly back to mind somehow too by much practice i suppose he had managed to elicit from his zither some sort of resemblance to what he remembered 
can't you imagine him working the scrap of music out in his brain humming it over whistling it unaccounted times with perpetual errors and confusion until some fine day he got it safe and sure and fixed it in his thoughts i can can't you imagine him then picking it out seditiously and laboriously on the strings i can indeed i can thus ethne got her answer and durrance interpreted it to her understanding she sat silent and very deeply moved by the story he had told to her it was fitting that this overture a favorite piece of music should have conveyed the message that he had not forgotten her that in spite of the fourth white feather he thought of her with friendship harry feversham had not striven so laboriously to learn that melody in vain ethne was stirred as she had thought nothing would ever again have the power to stir he wondered whether harry as he sat in the little bare whitewashed cafe and strummed out his music to the negroes and greeks and arabs gathered about the window had dreamed as she had done tonight that somehow thin and feeble as it was some echo of the melody might reach across the world she knew not how for very certain that however much she might in the future pretend to forget harry feversham it would never be more than a pretense the vision of the lighted cafe in the desert town would never be very far from her thoughts but she had no intention of relaxing on that account from a determination to pretend to forget the mere knowledge that she had at one time been unjustly harsh to harry made her yet more resolved that durrance should not suffer for any fault of hers i told you last year ethne at hill street durrance resumed that i never wished to see feversham again i was wrong the reluctance was all on his side and not at all on mine for the moment that he realized he had called out my name he tried to edge backwards from me into the crowd he began to gabble greek but i caught him by the arm and i would not let him go he had done you some great wrong that i knew but i could not remember it then i only remembered that years before harry feversham had been my friend my one great friend that we had rowed in the same college boat at oxford he had stroked i at seven that the stripes on his jersey during three successive eights had made my eyes dizzy during those last hundred yards of spurt past the barges we had bathed together in sanford lasher on summer afternoons we had had supper on kennington island we had cut lectures and paddled up the Cher to Islip, and here he was at Wadi Hoffa, herding with that troop, an outcast sunk to such a depth of ill fortune that he must come to that squalid little town and play the zither vilely before a crowd of natives and a few Greek clerks for his night's lodging and the price of a meal. No, Ethne interrupted suddenly it was not for that reason that he went to wadi haifa why then asked durrance i cannot think but he was not in any need of money his father had continued his allowance and he had accepted it you are sure quite sure i heard it only today said ethne it was a slip but ethne for once was off her guard that night she did not even notice that she had made a slip she was too engrossed in durrance's story Durrance himself, however, was not less preoccupied, and so the statement passed for the moment unobserved by either. So you never knew what brought Mr. Feversham to Haifa, she asked. Did you not ask him? Why didn't you? Why? She was disappointed, and the bitterness of her disappointment gave passion to her cry. Here was the last news of Harry Feversham, and it was brought to her incomplete like the half sheet of a letter the omission might never be repaired i was a fool said durrance there was almost as much regret in his voice now as there had been in hers and because of that regret he did not remark 
the passion with which she had spoken. I shall not easily forgive myself. He was my friend, you see. I had him by the arm, and I let him go. I was a fool, and he knocked upon his forehead with his fist. He tried Arabic, Durrance resumed, pleading that he and his companions were just poor, peaceable people that if i had given him too much money i should take it back and all the while he dragged away from me but i held him fast i said harry feversham that won't do and upon that he gave in and spoke in english whispering it let me go jack let me go there was the crowd about us it was evident that harry had some reason for secrecy it might have been shame for all i knew shame at his downfall i said come up to my quarters in haifa as soon as you are free and i let him go all that night i waited for him on the veranda but he did not come in the morning i had to start across the desert i only spoke of him to a friend who came to see me dot to calder in fact you know of him the man who sent you the telegrams said durrance with a laugh yes i remember ethne answered it was the second slip she had made that night the receipt of calder's telegram was just one of the things that durrance was not to know but again she was unaware that she had made a slip at all she did not even consider how durrance had come to know or guess that the telegram had ever been dispatched at the very last moment durrance resumed when my camel had risen from the ground i stooped down to speak to him to tell him to see Feversham, but I did not. You see, I knew nothing about his allowance. I merely thought that he had fallen rather low. It did not seem fair to him that another should know of it. So I rode on and kept silence. Ethne nodded her head. She could not but approve, however poignant her regret for the lost news. So you never saw Mr. Feversham again. I was away nine weeks. I came back blind. He answered simply, and the very simplicity of his words went to Ethne's heart. He was apologizing for his blindness, which had hindered him from inquiring. She began to wake to the comprehension that it was really Durrance who was speaking to her, but he continued to speak, and what he said drove her quite out of all caution. I went at once to Cairo, and Calder came with me. There I told him of Harry Feversham, and how I had seen him at to Fika. I asked Calder when he got back to Haifa to make inquiries, to find and help Harry Feversham, if he could. I asked him, too, to let me know the result. I received a letter from Calder a week ago, and I am troubled by it, very much troubled. What did he say? Ethne asked apprehensively, and she turned in a chair away from the moonlight towards the shadow of the room and Durant's. She bent forward to see his face, but the darkness hid it. A sudden fear struck through her and chilled her blood. But out of the darkness, Durrance spoke. That the two women and the old Greek had gone back northward on a steamer to Assouan. Mr. Feversham remained at Whitey Haffa, then? That is so, isn't it? She said eagerly. No, Durrance replied. Harry Feversham did not remain. He slipped past Haifa the day after I started towards the east. He went out in the morning and to the south. Into the desert? Yes, but the desert to the south, the enemy's country. He went just as I saw him, carrying his zither. He was seen, there can be no doubt. Ethne was quite silent for a while. Then she asked, You have that letter with you? Yes. I should like to read it. She rose from her chair and walked across to Durant's. He took the letter from his pocket and gave it to her, and she carried it over to the window. The moonlight was strong. Ethne stood close to the window with a hand pressed upon her heart and read it through once and again. The letter was explicit. The Greek who owned the cafe at which the troupe had performed admitted that Giuseppe, under which name he knew Feversham, had wandered south carrying a water skin and a store of dates though why he either did not know or would not tell. Ethne had a question to ask, but it was some time before she could trust her lips to utter it distinctly and without faltering. What will happen to him? At the best, capture. At the worst, death. 
death by starvation or thirst, or at the hands of the dervishes. But there is just a hope that it might be only capture and imprisonment. You see, he was white. If caught, his captures might think him a spy. They would be sure he had knowledge of our plans and our strength. I think that would most likely send him to Omdurman. I have written to Calder. Spies go out and in from Wadi Hafa. We often hear of things which happen in Amduman. If Feversham is taken there, sooner or later I shall know, but he must have gone mad. It is the only explanation. Ethne had another, and she knew hers to be the right one. She was off her guard, and she spoke it aloud to Durrance. Colonel Trench, she said, is a prisoner at Amduman. Oh, yes, answered Durrance. Feversham will not be quite alone. There is some comfort in that, and perhaps something may be done. When I hear from Calder, I will tell you. Perhaps something may be done. It was evident that Durrance had misconstrued her remark. He, at all events, was still in the dark as to the motive which had taken Feversham southward beyond the Egyptian patrols, and he must remain in the dark for ethne did not even now slacken in her determination still to pretend to have forgotten she stood at the window with the letter clutched in her hand she must utter no cry she must not swoon she must keep very still and quiet and speak when needed with a quiet voice even though she knew that harry feversham had gone southward to join colonel trench and omdurman but so much was beyond her strength for as Colonel Durrance began to speak again, the desire to escape, to be alone with this terrible news, became irresistible. The cool quietude of the garden, the dark shadows of the trees, called to her. Perhaps you will wonder, said Durrance, why I have told you tonight what I have up to now kept to myself. I did not dare to tell it to you before. I want to explain why. Ethne did not notice the exultation in his voice she did not consider what his explanation might be she only felt that she could not now endure to listen to it the mere sound of a human voice had become an unendurable thing she hardly knew indeed that durrance was speaking she was only aware that a voice spoke and that the voice must stop she was close by the window a single silent step and she was across the sill and free Durrance continued to speak out of the darkness, engrossed in what he said, and Ethne did not listen to a word. She gathered her skirts carefully so that they should not rustle and stepped from the window. This was the third slip which she made upon that eventful night. End of chapter 18